Yes, sir, we can start now. So good evening. Albert Einstein said, if we knew what it was we were doing, it would not be a called research, would it? As clinician, we are all involved in treatment of our patients, always trying for improving their lives. In this endeavor, we often give lesser importance on clinical research, forgetting its far-fetched impact. In this COVID era, we realize that when we face a new menace, only research work augmented with up-to-date improved knowledge can bail us out of difficult scenarios. We should all focus on this often neglected, but vastly promising aspect of our clinical practice. And it is not an impossible task if we can improve our initiative to formalize our curiosity. With these intention, we have arranged today's webinar on research in clinical practice under the aegis of Bellevue Clinic Kolkata and Advanced Healthcare Foundation. I heartily welcome all delegates, faculties, and participants in this journey of knowledge. Now, let us start with today's session. Participants can send their queries via the chat box, which will be answered by the faculties later on. And our first session is Introduction in Health Research. The speaker is Professor Santanu Tripathi. And the session will be chaired by Professor Dhruv Choudhury, a good friend of mine. Presently, he is the professor and head Palmore in Critical Care Medicine, PLBDS, PEIMS, UHS, UHS Rotok, Haryana, India. Actually, he is doing a lot of research work from, from the beginning of his career. Presently, he is a member of Lancet India Task Force on COVID-19. He is also the president, Association of Common Health Scholars and Fellows. He is a state nodal officer of Haryana COVID-19. Hello. He's also the, he was also the immediate past president, Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. He was ex-dean medical super specialty, UHS Rotok, Haryana, India, twice, and ex-dean student wel welfare. He was the ex-vice chancellor, Indian College of Critical Care Medicine. Now I request Professor Dhrupa Choudhury to start his session. Professor Dhrupa Choudhury, please. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Saurabh. Uh, in fact, uh, it is in a, such a short period of point of time, we have been able to organize a thing which is important, which usually looks very mundane to the people in day-to-day -day clinical practice. But as you rightly said, and you have quoted Einstein also, that these are it is these things which you observe. And then subsequently, with the help of science, we are able to prove it or disprove it that we stand the test of the time. And the COVID period has been an exponent, is, is in a big example of that. And looking at this, you see recently, the way Omicron was picked up by the shoot observations of the clinicians. And then subsequently, when the lab and the clinicians talked about it, we came to know. Same has been theory of, uh, same has been the uh, vaccination story. So there are multiple stories which we have seen. We are looking at the basic immunology, how we are going from bench to bedside, and everywhere it is acute observations, lab investigations, combine them with clinical data we have come up. And it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Shantanu Kumar Tripathi, who is the Director of Clinical Research at the Center for Liver Research and Innovation at Sonarpur, Kolkata, as well as his Dean Academic and heading the Department of Pharmacology at Bihata, Patna, he also is a visiting professor of Indira Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, Patna. Dr. Shantanu Kumar Tripathi has multiple awards under his hat, and he has been the principal investigator of COVAX phase two, three clinical trials, which is going, to, which has been approved recently by DCJI. And he has been the member standing national committee on 
medicine, government of India. He is the honorary advisor to the government of West Bengal for COVID-19 vaccines and vaccination. He is member of West Bengal State Committee of Adverse Event uh, Surveillance following the immunization. What is important, I'm happy to see, is that somewhere for pediatricians, it has qualified gone to the, uh, the qualified clinical pharmacologist. And also, he has significant publications in both national and international journals, has written more than 10 books, and has also been the member of the National Ethical Guidelines of Biomedical Research of Indian Council of Medical Research. He has also written the Berlin book on the co-authored the ISDBEU, Berlin Declaration of Pharmacovigilance, and also has been the recipient of WHO Fellowship. So he has a pretty distinguished career and is pretty well known outside uh, West Bengal. Also, we all know him. And uh, I request now Professor Shantanu Kumar Tripathi to take over the floor, please. Lord Tripathi, please. Thank you very much, Professor Chaudhuri. It's, it's great meeting you again. Thank you. So give me just a minute for sharing this screen. Is the screen visible? Yes, Dr. Tripathi. OK, thank you. So today, uh, there sir, is some... Just, just make it full screen, sir. Sorry to say again. Uh, so I think it's, I have to do it again. Sir, if you'll go down, uh, downside now, you will find... Uh, you see, you do F5. You do F5. Uh, Dr. Tripathi, you, on your uh, laptop, you just do the screen one. I think that will be, yeah. Is it full screen now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So there are some issues with the audio sometimes, but then I hope that uh, things will now will take care. Uh, today, this evening, uh, we have a quite a good number of very important, uh, interesting sessions. And to start with, I have to talk about uh, introduction to health research. Uh, I have only a few slides, and I'll just talk for 10, 12 minutes. Uh, we all are here. with medical background, and we are all doctors. And uh, we appreciate the importance of health research, but this is only to reiterate uh, in this today's uh, webinar uh, that how important or how relevant health research is in order to actually uh, provide the healthcare services and in order to have a get a better quality of life for our people so that they can be productive in the society. They can really meaningfully contribute to the development of the society and development of the nation. That is the whole purpose of uh, healthcare. And in order to be uh, relevant to healthcare, we need to also engage ourselves into health research. Just think of uh, the situation of healthcare about a hundred years back, what it was, as compared to uh, as we have today, although definitely we are much better off as compared to hundred years back, but then that doesn't mean the need for health research and all this has been possible because of contribution by the health research but then this does not mean that uh, we else is left with us. Uh, as we answer uh, 
unique research questions in reference to health and healthcare. Newer questions crop up, and we need to find answer to that. And uh, it is only through health research we can try to find newer and newer research questions so that we can offer better life and longer life to the individuals and also a me meaningful life to the society. That's the very purpose of health research. When you talk of defining health research, it is nothing but purposeful and systematic investigation. Any research for, this, for that purpose is basically a purposeful and systematic investigation. Now, when you talk of health research, it relates to collecting data, describing them, analyzing them, interpreting them, relevant data and information around health and disease. When you talk of human health, we have to first understand health and the departure from health, that is disease. And in order to better understand, we, we need to we need to frame the right question, research question, and in order to answer that research question, adopt the right methods, follow the right methods in the right design, and then lay our hands into collection of data, process them, analyze them, and interpret them, finally come to a conclusion which may or may not be very precisely answering the primary question, but if it, it does not precise the answer, then there is something wrong somewhere in our, in our endeavor towards finding that answer that is in our methodology. So to adopt the appropriate methodology and the right research design and steps are extremely, extremely important in order to reach out to the right answer to the carefully framed question. Now, broadly speaking, the health research could be of three kinds broadly, exploratory kind, when you are trying to find new information whatsoever, absolutely new information. Many a times we need to also confirm the available information, health information. And more often than not, we are also there to do causal research. That means cause and effect research. And that could be again of uh, finding new uh, technologies or new tool for treating diseases, or it could be also to find the right uh, kind of etiological basis in understanding certain diseases, okay? So causal research, okay? So it could be in uh, like the cohort uh, design or the uh, case control design, or for that matter, the clinical trial. All these are actually causal research. You are trying to find an association between cause and effect. The purpose of doing health research could be also many a times to develop newer tools and technologies, and such tools and technologies uh, could be in reference to uh, some therapeutic solution to certain diseases. It could also be preventing disease, like we are for the last more than couple of years, we are passing through a pandemic phase stage, and that is for COVID-19. And we all know how desperately we wanted to have a preventive solution to this, the vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccines. And to a great extent, we have been pretty successful for that pandemic vaccine, which has reduced the deaths and the hospitalization to a great, great extent. So preventive solution to diseases, diagnostic solution, diagnosing the disease, palliative solution, okay, when you are trying to actually, uh, trying to allay the suffering of a disease of the different kinds of symptoms, restorative uh, solution, restoring health and rehabilitative rehabilitation of, of uh, certain kind of problems, health problems. So for all these purposes, we can need or we can have the right kind of health research. We do health research in order to uh, develop the public health policies. So 
health research is not just to optimize individual health or individual disease treatment or disease or care individual care but also from a public health standpoint okay and the decision making uh, by the policy makers that is also based on has to be based on evidences and such evidences can be created only through good quality research today's uh, healthcare delivery and the medical practice is based on evidence evidence we believe in evidence based medicine these days and the level and the strength of evidence is only possible through good quality health research we also know of the uh, subtle differences or distinction between basic research and applied research basic research in simple words we can say bench research or uh, when we are uh, thinking of uh, understanding the causation of a disease okay at the cellular level subcellular level all these will relate to basic research that is what is called wet lab research on the other hand uh, it could be also applied research when you are trying to actually uh, actually uh, modify or trying to understand the uh, the pathogenesis of a disease the way the disease is presented and then how you can change the course of the disease or how you can actually cure a disease so that in reference to applied research epidemiological research and then clinical research or for that matter the uh, hospital based research they are also one way of looking at that clinical research bench to bed side research also we have heard uh, and that is what is called in other way we can call it translational research so this is also an area where there might be lot of deficiency that we can do lot of research but until unless that is applied in the real uh, in the in the real world practice okay uh, the whole purpose of research will be wasted and we cannot afford to do that so translation is the ultimate uh, ultimate uh, end of any research uh, endeavor and translational research also uh, comprises of one important component of health research we also come across uh, types of research like implementation research lot many uh, programs health programs healthcare programs or disease control programs are implemented and while we are trying to implement them we can also incorporate an element of research there in order to see whether uh, the the implementation of the program is ultimately uh, achieving the the desired goal or not if not then what kind of uh, mid course corrections are to be made so if that is done then we call it kind of implementation research research is always resource intensive and uh, all kind all different kinds of resources are required whether it is the expert manpower or the human skills uh, whether it is materials or resource research materials the, if it is clinical research you need patients if it is vaccine research you need healthy volunteers if it is basic research you need chemicals reagents and the laboratories so and of course the time quality time of the researcher the skills of the researcher all these are required so until unless we have pooled all these resources and prepare, we are prepared to lay our hands into research uh, this is not going to be successful and finally the health systems research when uh, basically the healthcare delivery system uh, when we are trying to deliver whether it is in hospital the doctors nurses the medicines okay the uh, ot so there, uh, if we try to also look into that the, the treatment protocols and then how we are going to utilize them in order to deliver healthcare and these are all components of the health system and there if we see uh, try to develop a precise research question and try to test that try to find some answer to that precise question in order to better deliver care to our people then it it will be they will be called as health systems research 
the prerequisites essential prerequisites of a research for that matter in any research it starts with a good planning or identifying a good idea and then you need to also do whatever is already known about this if it is whether it is really a novel idea and in order to do that and where are the gaps if, the, if is there any real research gap is it worthy of using utilizing this scarce resource into this to do this research so this is this all will be in the planning part and ultimately it is expected that a protocol for the research proposed research is to be drafted and that can be redrafted and uh, the final until we reach the final version and there all the different stakeholders who will be involved in research they should be taken into co uh, con confidence in developing the research protocol so any research must have very clear and precise objectives okay smart objectives we call it okay and then uh, depending on the research objectives uh in order to realize those objectives the most appropriate method that is to be and the design are to be used and then we can think of trying to identify the different resources so that will be required and pool all these resources and then engage ourselves into the implementation or the conduct of research that is what is called research process and then finally we have to we have to appropriately uh uh compile the data capture the data compile process them analyze them and interpret them and then finally uh, write the report of, of our research and then it the, mat, the thing doesn't end there we need to communicate whatever we have done uh, we need to communicate the outcome of research to all the relevant stakeholders so that ultimately uh, if it is worthy then it can be applied properly so that uh, the necessary uh, changes in our behavior that can be arrived at so these are the essential prerequisites and steps that are involved in health research the different way of looking at health research and uh, that way the types of health research would uh, involve qualitative versus quantitative research most of us are Uh, more familiar with quantitative research which involves numbers 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 and numbers are quantitative research but qualitative research are narratives or words when we we talk to people when we interview them and then try to understand the 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 need and the gap where they can be properly addressed so qualitative research so day by day we are uh, appreciative of the need for qualitative research more and more into our healthcare research or health research then we have the descriptive versus analytical research descriptive research like the uh, the the observational type of research and uh, where you narrate and uh, uh, the 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 cross sectional design research and analytical research causal research is an analytical research where cause and effect uh, association is researched like in clinical trials like in uh, cohort studies or case control studies etc observational research and experimental research so observational basic difference between the observational experimental research where the researcher or the investigator is not assigning treatment uh that is observational research that means what is the what is the usual kind of practice or uh, healthcare practice or medical practice that is going on we are trying to observe that okay as a researcher passively and trying to find an answer to our research question that is observational research so for the purpose of research no intervention is meant no research intervention is meant on the other hand in experimental research the investigator assigns particular treatment for the purpose of research to the research participant so that is what is called experimental research so there could be a new drug which can be actually investigated against 
existing standard drug or a placebo okay and that is an experimentation so experimental research also known as trials clinical trials they are always prospective in nature while observational research could be both either prospective or retrospective or cross sectional observational research so depending on the direction whether it is outcome to the exposure that is retrospective research whether it is a uh, intervention to outcome it becomes prospective design which happens in the uh, the clinical trials particularly but it can also happen in case of say cohort studies okay cohort cohort observational design and in cross sectional both the exposure and outcome happens at the same instance that is cross sectional design of research going to the next slide when you think of research all research is to be properly reviewed and overseen and there are broadly three types of uh, review or over oversight that is done with research scientific oversight that it has to be scientifically the research question is to be scientifically sound and the methodology that are used must be scientifically valid so scientific research scientific oversight or scientific review that must be undertaken prior to uh, starting the research similarly we have ethical oversight and ethics review and that is actually to look into the interest of the research participants because in the name of science we cannot actually uh, ignore the interest of the research participants we have to ensure their rights and well being are properly protected and that's what is research ethics and we know the different principles of ethics is autonomy uh, non maleficence beneficence and justice these are the cardinal principles of ethics in research and of course we also have to have regulatory oversight particularly when you think of getting a new technology or a new drug or a new vaccine new diagnostics to come in the market so the uh, regulatory authorities are to review it that whether or not there is a real need and whether or not the appropriate methodology are being followed and whether or not finally at the end of such research the uh, the the sponsor would like to get that product come in the market so that regulatory decision on behalf of the society it is the government to take that regulatory decision and even when the regulatory research that is pre marketing clinical research or pre marketing non clinical research when they are undertaken the regulatory authority has to do a proper oversight and every country have their own uh, drugs and clinical trial rules in india also we have the latest one is 2019 new drugs and clinical trial rules earlier it used to be called schedule y so cdso in india actually oversees the regulatory research in the country so uh, these are the three broad types of review and oversight that must be undertaken because as we have said that research is highly resource intensive and we cannot afford to uh, waste the resources scarce resources uh, in the name of conduct of research research will shall be conducted only when it is it is precisely required needed and appropriately conducted with uh, full scientific validity and also with uh, observance of the necessary ethical norms ethical conduct of research is the responsible research uh, clinical research is all about human research whether or not the human participant is healthy or the human participant is a patient so clinical research we also know of epidemiological research so where whereby we actually undertake the the uh, behavior and the uh, of human health and diseases in the community so the determinants of diseases uh, they are actually looked into through epidemiological research and most of the time the design of epidemiological research is mostly observational but of course clinical uh, trials can also be considered in broader sense in philosophical sense is also a type of epidemiological research the 
term epidemiological means upon uh, people. So it, it AP and demos upon people. So that's about epidemiological research. Now, research is of one type and that is good research. And uh, GCP stands for good clinical practice. Practically speaking, it is good clinical research practice. And this is the uh, definition of good clinical research practice that has been universally accepted or uh, uh, defined. There are, uh, WHO has defined good clinical practice and International Conference on Harmonization have also defined this. So this definition is uh, widely uh, recognized and uh, there is a global consensus on this definition. So uh, it, it reads like it is a standard, it is called a scientific and ethical standard rather, for the design, conduct, performance, monitoring, auditing, recording, analysis, and reporting of clinical trials that provides assurance uh, that the data and reported results are credible on one hand, and credible and accurate, and that the rights, integrity, and confidentiality of trial subjects are protected. Although GCP uh, definition or the GCP principles primarily were developed in terms of the conduct of clinical trials, the experimental uh, health research, but in the principles of GCP is also equally applies in the observational research for that matter. So we must remember these two arms of good clinical practice. That is one is credible data generation, reliable data generation. And the second is the research participants rights, integrity and confidentiality to be protected. That is the ethical part. So the science and ethics, the marriage of science and ethics are uh, very clearly visible in, in the definition of good clinical practice. So all of us who are involved in conduct of clinical trials, we have to really follow these principles of good clinical practice. I think uh, that is the last slide. And uh, in our, in our uh, passion in uh, undertaking health research or clinical research, many a times we forget the rights and the uh, integrity of the research participants. And there has been, the history is replete with huge number of atrocities and it is still continuing. Uh, so long the human race would try to do health research. There are possibilities and risks of these atrocities. And what George Warner Shaw had said one day that atrocities are not less atrocities when they occur in laboratories and are called medical research. Uh, so a little sarcastic, but the spirit behind it is that in the name of research, we cannot forget our obligation towards the research participants. We should be fair to them. With these few words, thank you very much. And I just tried to have a very superficial, sketchy uh, overview of the uh, fundamentals of uh, introduction to health research. Thank you very much. Over. Thank you, Dr. Shantanu. And uh, I think it has been in a very extensive overview over a period of time. And uh, I think we can take up the question answers later if Dr. Sarokole agrees with me. Yes, we can, we can take the questions later. And the uh, participants are requested to send their question to the chat box. And now we are moving to a, um, before going to the next session, I must thank Dr. Shantanu Tipati for your excellent deliberation. And now uh, we are moving to a, a very important topic, uh, medical ethics and publication ethics. And we all know that medical ethics is based on a set of moral values by which a moral medical professional must conduct themselves, which can be applied to the practice of clinical medicine and related scientific research. The findings of any research is published in scientific journals to promote academic progression, to communicate research findings to the community, to identify research gaps, potential areas of future research, and also to increase responsibility to influence practice. This must be done conforming to the publication ethics. It is also a very important issue, which involves critical issues like breach of confidentiality, 
fabrication and falsification, authorship, plagiarism, ethics, related to the submission and conflict of interest. And uh, I'm sure that Dr. Dhrup Chaudhuri will, will, will give us, enlighten us regarding these issues. And the session will be chaired by Professor Rajan Pandey. Very short, in very shortly we can say that he is nephrologist by profession, academician by passion, and follower of ethics in medical, medical profession. He was also the past vice chancellor of our West Bengal Health University. So with these few words, we are going to start our next session, Medical Ethics and Publication Ethics. Dr. Rajan Pandey, please. Okay, we, I, should, I think I should uh, hand over the platform to the speaker so that more time he gets to elaborate on the ethical practices that he thinks is the correct manner to do. So, Dr. Dhrup Chaudhary, please share your screen and go ahead. Thank you, Professor Pandey, and uh, thank you, Saurabh, for giving me an opportunity. And in fact, uh, I was wondering whether I did the right thing of saying yes or no, but I think at the end of the day, it's a huge topic which you have given to me, the medical and publication ethics, but uh, that is what is uh, important and that's what defines the profession and professionalism, because every profession has an ethics and the moral values. And even as a human being also, we have our own moral values, more ethics. To a very large extent, they are defined by the culture, by the religion and the society in terms of it, which is a consequence of this. So I think a lot of things, uh, when you take in account and the diversity which is there, the cultural differences which are there, the religious differences which are there, I think that we need to look at it. Unfortunately, is not taught in our curriculum, but what I have realized is, is the most important aspect when you start looking at it, because they can help us in taking care of the dilemma. Now, Voltaire said, the doctors are men who prescribe medicines of which they know little, for diseases about which they understand even less, for people about whom they know nothing. I think much, it could not have been a prophetic, these words, if you see what has happened in the COVID. We had no clue what is happening. We're trying to prescribe right, left, and center without looking even at the consequences of it. And we all saw that we found in a higher incidence of muca, we found higher incidence of kappa, we have found in a higher incidence of complications and diabetic epidemic, which was there in the pandemic. Now, this is the classical uh, issues which you see in day-to-day -day life. Now, this is a tram which is coming up. And obviously, in this case, there are two routes. This is one which is not used, and this is the one which is used. And you can see the five children lying here and one child here who is a defender. Now, suddenly the vehicle, the, suddenly you realize that the strain is coming up. Now, it is for the gatekeeper to decide on which side it should be going. Now, these are the dilemmas which you see in clinical decision making. Now, the question is how you look at it. This is an open-ended question. One may say, try to save as much as other will say that the person who has been following the right tricks, right principles, why he or she should be punished for that. I think that's what the ethical dilemma which all of us face in day-to-day -day clinical life. However, uh, so let's, let's look at it. If you are there, what sort of a decision will you do? It? Will you like the train to stop? Will you rather let the train go away? And, and, and uh, if you want to go away, which side you will go up? I think these are the questions which are also in the clinical side. We, we have to take it up to do, to not to do, do, to not to do, to tell family how much to tell. These are the questions which keeps on coming up and that leads to a lot of ethical upheaval in the minds. When you talk in terms of morals or morals, whatever the way you want to pronounce it, it's morals basically an individual's own code of acceptable behavior. That is why there's a lot of conflict happens in terms of morality, what you feel, and what, and that's where the famous term is the Elizabethan or Victorian uh, morality principles which have been there, which may probably not be true to be applicable in modern days, but that's what we looked at it. Sometimes when you see we are a little regressive, we talk in terms of medieval behavior. But nevertheless, 
What is important is they arise from what you are, who you are, what environment you are. So they are the they arise from the individual's consciousness. They also tend to act guide for individual behavior. So they become very strong uh, impulses. They are very strong drivers of person's behavior, and that is what they are learned. And and what is important is that the way in you there are certain institution when you go. People who have not been delivering, they deliver because the work environment is there. They've changed their value system. There's another group when they see that persons are not working well, so why should I work when they are not? So they change their value system. So I think it is very important for us to remember is that when we talk in terms of it reminds me of Devdutt Patnaik's book of uh, where he talked about the three Bs about the business which is there, which we look at it, which is you can always do it. So you have. Understanding, you have a behavior, you have a business, and you have basically when you start looking up in terms of uh, uh, when you have a business and behavior, they all depend upon your values which you have earned, which you have imbibed, and that's the same thing which you do in the clinical practice. Ethics, if you see, basically the word which it has been coming up is with the rightness or wrongness of human behavior, which can, again, the rightness and wrongness can be very situational. Similarly, rightness and wrongness can also be, come upon your culture, upon your diversity, uh, upon your religious beliefs. So a lot of things starts coming into it because we are dealing with human beings. We are not dealing simply with disease. Therefore, when you start looking at the clinical psychologist, it becomes extremely important for us to see and look at it how human behavior is. It is concerned with the motivation which is behind the behavior and bioethics is the application of these principles to life and death issues, which we all see. When you look at the historical background, so Shutra Sainta says it, that the patient gives himself up in doctors and has no misgivings about it. If you really see how you talk to our teachers, teachers, they will say about it. Therefore, it was the physician's duty to look after him as his own son. That's what we have been practicing. That's how we have been. It's a very patriarchal way of looking at the uh, science. The patient may doubt his relatives, his sons, and even his parents, but he had full faith. That's what I always tell. When a person comes, he comes with, he or she comes with all the faith. They will talk and discuss with you about the things in their life. Probably they will not even have discussed with their parents, with their partners, or with their children. So I think it is very important. But Nevertheless, it, it is very important for us to stand by of that trust, that we have to trust one. You are not. That's what defines everything later on in your life. Charka talks about the four ethical principles of a doctor. That was the friendship. That was the sympathy towards the sick. Interest in cases according to one's capability. That means you should know your limitation. That is the one. If you remember the love and belly, the big surgeon make big incisions, but at the same time, big surgeon knows where to stop short. When we try to go up into an area which we have not charted and trying to experiment, I think that is unethical wrong. No attachment with the patient after his recovery. Sometimes we see that patient got hospitalized, we helped him out. No, as a professional, you did your duty. After that, if you're trying to look for a reward, I think it is wrong. And that's where the Gita also becomes important when we talk in, term, in terms of Karmani Dikaraste Mahafaleshu Kadachana. Keep on doing your work. That is what we have to do. They are that. This is what our karma is. That's what we have been here. So I think these are the four important ethical principles which even our old scriptures have been talking about. And then hypocrites also talk about in the same fashion that the dignity of a physician requires that he should look healthy and as plump as nature intended him to be. For the common crowd consider those who are not of this excellent bodily condition to be unable to take care of that means if you can't take care of yourself, how can you take care of yourself? So you need to be well presentable, well groomed. You should be in a sound mind and a sound health. Only then you will be able to take look at it. Say the word of advice and suggestion. But significant tragedies have been encountered over the years in medical research, where sometimes the curiosity has transcended the boundaries, which either way should not have been. And one of the classical example of which from where the things have started happening, the Nuremberg trial after the World War II, in which the, the German physicians actually experimented on the humans. They noted very meticulously what has happened 
a large number of the doctors were put on trial and were prosecuted, and quite a few of them were hanged also. Similarly, when you start looking at it, mentally retarded children infect, were infected with hepatitis virus in 1956 to see what is happening. Sometimes the liver cancer cells in the Jewish hospital were injected with liver cancer cells in 22 elderly patients. Now, what was the mechanism of immune reaction? Another classical example which was acceptable, which may not be legal, which was considered moral at that time, one of the girls who's, who was dying with the melanoma, the mother took and got implant, and nearly after 450 days, she died of disseminated melanoma. So, so it is very important. And look at it, physical, psychological damage of the participants took place when you had a behavioral study of obedience, which was done at Yale University. We have the history is full of it. And what is very important today is to learn a lesson from it. This Tuskegee study has been really an eye open. From 32 to 70, the Black Africans, uh, the, uh, the Black Americans, they had surface, they didn't know their partner got it, their children got it. And end of the day, the human Christ thought it up in 72. No penicillin was given up. And the study which started, gave us on 400 people in a group, they were uneducated, illiterate. They were just given placebos, nothing else. And treatment was there. Can we think in terms of doing it today? Answer is no. To that extent that even President Clinton has to ask, say sorry to the whole population because by the end of 72, only 70 people were alive. Similarly, once we started from the rural work, then we had the declaration of Helensky by the World Medical Association in 64. And it was that the concerns for the interest of the subject must always prevail over the interest of science and society. It means you need to protect the subject on which you are doing experimentation and from where the concept of informed consent has started and evolved. And today, whatever we do from patriarchal, we are going into share making, decision making, and informed consent. Quite often, we still feel patients will come and say, no, don't, don't, don't tell my parents. They will be hurt. Don't tell my child that they have my, my, my relations. They have got a spouse. They have got cancer. No, it's not right. I think it is very important. Now, today, whatever the ethical principle, irrespective of that we have evolved as human beings in society, were applicable because of non-availability of drugs today cannot be found to be ethical. So it changes with time. It changes with the advancement in the science also, but certain values which we stay, you will not go against the subject interest, whatever the disease or whatever the reasons compelling may be. So the two, the two cardinal principles in the management is ethics and the quality. And I think the integrity is the one which combines these two things together. Ethics is about making choices. And usually people try to fall for the uh, less resistance, but trust me, it is always the hard one when you try to practice ethics. That's what defines professionalism of highest order, and we need to be careful about it. Then, when you talk in terms of ethics, today we shall be talking about uh, primarily bioethics, where we will be discussing uh, clinical ethics and research ethics along with it. Uh, what happens in multiple places, you have a professional ethic, you have environmental, et cetera, et cetera, but we are primarily concerned today with bioethics. So the ethics importance is that there is advances in technology. You have a healthcare economics, which have been coming up. Somebody, people try, they go to the corporate hospital, they're thinking it is the best, and later on, they start coming back to you. And I say every day, this dilemma facing, that we have gone, we have gone away with that. We have lost the money, what to do, how to do, what to do. So keep transferring the patients from corporate hospitals because of lack of money. Public awareness of healthcare issues, that's important. Whether the public is aware about it or not, you look at the COVID epidemic. That's again a classical example. Patient advocate groups which come up, they try to look in terms of patient safety, becoming more and more prominent. And one of sometimes they can also create a problem like you are seeing a vaccine hesitancy. So we need to look at it, what sort of a group we are dealing with. Media is extremely hyperactive. They start getting into you. They're jumping, they're crawling like uh, uh, hungry tigers. I think it is very important for us. So, so, so to maintain a balance and continue to work in a professional manner. Negative elements, again, starts getting into it, which are much easier to absorb. That is greed, arrogance, deception, caution. All of you are knowing it, that people try to get into a lot of activities 
thinking they may grind, if it's a successful once you get into it, it's difficult. But this are, these are the few things which depend upon individuals and that's what as a professional, we must try to uh, resist and transformation of decision making to patient. We tell that we have told the patient, these are the three options you tell us, how can they tell us? It is you who has to work with the patient to help them taking a decision which is in the best interest of the patient, the family, and the society. When you start looking at it, the critical of the medical ethics, that branch of bioethics, which is primarily related to the identification, analysis, and resolution of moral problems that arise in the healthcare of individual patient. I think it's a self-explanatory definition which is there. We all talk in terms of principles of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, veracity, confidentiality in India, Practically, you will not see most of us working about very commonly we keep on talking about, and that leads also the fidelity and equally important in social responsibility and justice. And trust me, this is what we faced and the epidemic of COVID has taught us all these principles and all of you must have realized that how many of us were found wanting in terms of principles of it. Uh, in following the medical ethics in letter and spirit and how difficult it was when emotion is surcharged, volume when you have been overwhelmed by the number of patients and non-availability of drugs, non-availability of exact guidelines, non-availability of what to do, how to do was there. When you talk in terms of autonomy, I work in intensive care units and respiratory disease, so we see both sides of the sides. On the one side, we look at chronic disease, and then we look at the acute component, which is life threatening. But what is very important is right to self determination is the key. Similarly, requires decision making capacity. That means person should be mentally alert. Lack should be proven and not assumed. And quite often, what we see is a surrogate decision making take place in our country. So we need to be very careful what are the rationals and the reasons for those decision making. Competence is determined by the law and not by your own whims and fancies. So it is very important is that whenever we are practicing the ethics, it has to be within the boundary of the social cultural acceptance, but the law defines the outer limit, which was there. Liberty is that patient has the freedom to influence course of life and treatment, and they can take the scene at their own level when they understood everything. And that's what we say the classical autonomy. And if some surrogate decision making is there, then obviously it means legally person is not in a capacity. And more so, it happens in the case of children. Beneficence is doing good for others. I think this is important. All of us are aware about it. It means obligation to preserve life, restore health, relieve suffering, and remain functional. Health professional need to assist clients in meeting all their needs. And this is the first principle, primum non nocere. And that's what we do it as a doctors, as an intensive care unit. It is the primary job for us that we do not cause any injury. Therefore, if I'm not aware about it, let's be honest about it, frank about it, and say, sorry, we can't do it. And then you look at it when you have to see some decisions have to be calculated risk or risk benefit. You look at it in panic, the amount of steroids which we gave to the patient the first week in COVID and how it has landed up us in a problem later on. So I think it's important that decision making has to be there, risk taking has to be there, but it has to be seen that the minimum damage to occur and primarily for me, the first and foremost thing, first cause no harm, even if you cannot do any benefit. That is truth telling is clear. Obligation is to full and honest disclosure. We recently had a patient of a cancer. She was not told, she had a big breast lump, she had a massive effusion. Both sons are saying, don't tell her, don't tell her, she will not tolerate it. We by the Indian practice, okay, we listen to it, no. We need to tell patient. We did talk to her, a language in which you could appreciate, understand what is there. She had a grade four metastatic disease. We need to tell. Patient had no clue. Therefore, similarly, when you have taken the patient inside, you need to tell our st right status. What we decide is that because as a doctors, we may not be bombarded by the question, may not be bombarded later on by the legal other thing. We try to, if it is 10, we say 20. If it is 20, we say 40. No. Try to tell them, be truthful. And, and one can actually narrate a lot of stories. I had a lady who had a referred, was, went to somewhere else, treated, was a myasthenia which was missed. She developed a rest. Ultimately, we lost her. When the son came, and I, 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 I 
extended apologies because this patient was in one of the sister units. Extended apologies rather than, and that this is one thing which we trusted each other and it happened, it should not have been done. And, uh, and that, that, that then I explained to him the whole story. The son gave me a mail which sent from US and I came to sue the doctors, but I realized how human they are, how variable they can be. So I think it is very important. Truth telling is the one, it leads to closure. And we must understand that part and we must talk. About it. Confidentiality, again, we must do it. If somebody has got HIV, somebody got other things, please don't talk about it. They are the very talking, the intimate secrets to you. Please respect it. In Indian context, we are extremely loose talking about it there. I think all of us are guilty of it at some time. Just a social responsibility. We all read about it. I faced it myself this time in COVID epidemic. As a chairperson of the uh, tocilizumab, we were given 160 tocilizumab for the state of Haryana during the peak of COVID. It was, it was terrible for both public and private sector when the whole of Delhi I was coming to Gurgaon. I was having, we had so many admissions, what to do? We made guidelines and you will be surprised. We, we, we did not budge to any pressure, whether political, bureaucratic or social. The only thing we also for the first time realized the social distributive system. After 70 years, we just refused to provide the tocilizumab. And that probably for the first time in my life, I had to put that principle so that we can help the maximum which was there. So I think that is very important. What is unethical? Again, it is a contextual, legal, and the society. In Indian context, non-determination of sex is illegal, and therefore it is unethical. Because it leads to killing of With their degrees. If a treatment, if you start treating somebody with practice without concern, one of our colleagues has been aware that uh, they, they did in the uh, in consent was there. Doing it or you start experimenting. Dichotomy, what is the unnecessary testing? Look at biggest, uh, I, I think we need to stop it, the biggest uh, drama which is going up is, is the preventive biochemical bio, bio, bio testing which is being done across the board. It doesn't prevent any disease except if you want to diagnose diabetes or renal failure. Short of that, you see, it has just deluded the places that people are coming with an executive health checkup. Yes, you need executive health checkup. On case to not that, somebody coming with 30 investigations is unethical. Procuring patients, it's so rampant to the all hospitals. Where you're saying the ambulance people you pay 10,000 bucks, other people you again pay a certain amount. There are patients who have been referred to there, they ask 25% of the bills. All are unethical, and that is what we need to define. We try to take the sh try to, uh, uh, shadow of, or we try to take the, uh, try to go back. The lawyers, what they're doing is no, it's entirely different thing. Therefore, please remember one thing, this should not be done. Professional secrecy or confidentiality are interrelated. You need to respect that. An ethical dilemma starts coming up when there is a problem and there is a difference between that. The principle like we had that train from where to go person who followed the rule or person who did not follow the rule. Both sides have goodness and badness associated with that. The classical bioethical dilemma is that one heart is available. You should get it. A 70-year-old girl, 40-year-old principal, 70-year-old woman, Answer will be either 70 or 40, but if your 70 year old girl is a drug addict, 40 year old has a chronic liver disease, and 70 year old woman is here and healthy, obviously the pendulum shifts to 70 year old woman. So the point I'm trying to make here is the key for us to remember, my dear friends, is the context in which we are talking of or discussing the problem. So the ethical dilemma is medically right versus patient's preference. What is preferred by the patient versus the proxy decision maker? This can happen nowadays with the elderly, which are well read. Similarly, the children, there can be a conflict in them. Similarly, rights of minor versus legal guardian. These are real questions. I will not go, otherwise, I will not be there. Examples are full of it. Similarly, notification of sexual partners of patients with HIV. One trial went up where they did not tell the, uh, their partners that the partner that whom they are getting married uh, is HIV. There's a lot of ruckus which happened on it. Therefore, it is important for us to see the context in which we are talking and doing the things. So the moral context that leads to the moral context of doctor-patient relationship of honesty, integrity, 
mutual respect, trust, which is actually lacking, that is leading to a lot of problems. Empathy and goal mutual should be the benefit of the patient, benefit of the person, so that they again regain their health. That's the key. So confidentiality, communication, empathy is important. We don't want to be sympathetic. We must not be sympathetic. Sympathy is I want to help you. Nobody self-serving person, person who has a self-respect will accept it. But empathy is that I am you. What I am going to do. Therefore, empathy is difficult to find when obviously doctors also face it. When patients are, they don't trust them. So it is very important for us that first principle of the doctor-patient relationship is the trust. So moral consideration is non-maleficence. Non-maleficence. That means whether medical indication is there or not. That we need to see. Beneficence, we talk in terms like today we are talking of whether to give remdesivir, whether to give molonopiravir, or to give monoclonal antibodies or Paxo. It all depends availability. If nothing else is there, obviously, which one you try to get? Autonomy is what quality of life is this treatment I'm going to give you. Will it improve or will it improve? And just as a contextual picture, I already gave you an example. So law and ethics will always go. We must look for the law for the guidance. Law does not always provide answers. And law may be very specific applying to certain cases. Ethical analysis is also important that moral duty, obligation, and conduct, it cannot substitute for proper legal. So whenever you practice law, try to be empathetic, try to help people, but it all must be parameter of law. Otherwise, you can be sued. So the ethics is a crossroads, but end of the day, your value system will decide it. Looking at it, no harm to the patient, but all the best you can do for the patient. That itself will lead to a lot of things. When you look at a public ethics, that also transcends from there. People have been doing in the culture of publish or parish. And that is what gives you a professional status, prestige, and promotion. And now the Medical Council of India has made, or now the NMC has made mandatory for publication for promotion. So career progression also depends upon it. The grants also. It. Therefore, research what you do, if it is not written, it is of no good use. Therefore, research without publication is non-existing research. Publish patient, that's what I talked to you. When you do a trial, when you do a trial, what is very important for us to remember, the stakeholders are sponsors, the investigators, the regulators, and ethics committee. So your sponsors comes to investigator, which goes to ethics committee, that goes to regulators, regulators look at the sponsor, and so on and so forth. When you are publishing a trial, who is responsible? Primarily, it is the authors. And obviously, the authors who tend to be the author, it can either be investigators, or if the sponsors are doing all study according to them, then they. So investigators and sponsors, if you look at today, the COVAXIN trial, it is both the investigators and the sponsors, the Bharat Biotech, and along with ICMR, have been part and parcel of the studies which have been published in Lancet. So it goes, then there is a peer review and the editors. So it goes from the authors to the editors, then it goes to the peer review, and this is how the circle moves. So all are bound by certain rules, laws, or ethics so that the right research reaches, because what we see is negative research which is much less than the positive one, and we need to be careful about it, because sometimes it is the negative research which gives you more answers than the positive research, and when a pharmaceutical-based research is there, please be careful about it, because possibility is there, they may highlight small advantage to a very large extent, whereas the disadvantages may be put under the carpet. So what are the major issues when you are looking at it, you see for it, that what is the study design and whether the ethical approval is there or not. If you are doing a study today, even the postgraduate thesis without ethics is not acceptable. Data analytics, who will get the authorship? What are the conflict of interest? That's why they all ask, who has reviewed the peer reviewed? Whether they ever biased they have their own set of ideas or whether you bring a redundant publication from somewhere you have picked up and put it up. And then plagiarism again, what we talk, or the auto plagiarism where I keep on uh, repeating, or I keep on citing my own studies, and then the duties of an editor, how they look. And these are the major challenges which we face every day. Publication, it leads to publication bias, data. Then the question which is now coming up is who's going to own the data? When you are doing a multiple studies, whether it is the industry, whether it's the sponsors, whether it is the, the person or the investigators, I think it becomes a lot of these issues which are coming up going into legal sphere. Similarly, the redundant publication has become, which could be either salami publication where you start looking at small, small, small amount, or studies which have been published, you pick up from there and try to put your own. 
Similarly, a lot of people are getting into fabrication and falsification. Fabrication is cooking up and falsification is manipulation in simple language. That's how we look at it. So we need to look at study design and ethical approval. And the most important part comes up is, my dear friends, is fully informed consent and supervision by principal investigator. They are busy quite often and they may have a conflict of clinical duty, teaching and research. That's why we always should prefer to have some research associate assistant who can do and then you supervise. But fully informed consent is the key, what you are doing, why you are doing, what are the advantages and disadvantages. Authorship is a very key issue. Who should be the first author, second author, who should be given? Not the ghost author. Ghost author should not be there, ideally speaking. But we all know that if somebody is important, somebody is related, people try to put their name every day, husband putting wife, wife putting husband, son, daughter, in son, daughter, that must not be done. Participation, it should only be given that who, have who has conceptualized it, who has drafted it, who has revised it, who has given approval, who have read it, edited it. Not the heads, data collectors, or the sponsors. Now you need to define, that's where the form comes up, that you must define how, what contribution each has done it. And this has to be a joint decision and must be signed by and approval. Otherwise, it can lead to conflict where the authors say they have been asked to do and uh, uh, we, we, we were never asked for it. And that's a very common thing which is happening. No supervisor section at departmental chair, proofreader or editor who has been paid for fees should be an author. But obviously, uh, a person should have made their contribution in designing, execution, then writing, and then supervising and editing. These are the six, that's what I said. Acknowledgement, there are a large number of other people who have helped you out, so put them in the heading of acknowledgement. That is what we should do. Conflict of interest is important, which can be financial, personal. Today, you will see a large number of webinars are happening, and you will see a number of people are going into it. Scratch your head. Look at it in your head. Large number are being paid, so you will see people are far more interested in going and joining the webinars. Conflict of interest, therefore, are important. A lot of people have recently been, must have seen, have been withdrawn. And what we are seeing is energy and paper say it has an influence on New York Stock Exchange. That is important. Sometimes people have biases. That's why when you set for reviews, you don't put the institution. Academic people try to do it. If you see, they ask that postgraduate thesis were, okay, what was done in Rothak? Has it been done in Delhi? Let's do it in Calcutta. Or what has been done in Calcutta? We pick it up. No, that's not done. You may try to prove or disprove a hypothesis is a separate issue. But Trying to look somebody's other work and try to create that thing is not acceptable. Peer review is important. There are external experts chosen by the editors. They need to provide written opinion with the aim of improving the study. And these are important. They should all report suspected misconduct to the editor and their regular audits have to be done. Scientific misconduct, as I talk, can be very serious, but you can have deliberate or unintentional, but both have the same consequences. And that is why in this era, either unknowing or we have deliberate is not pardoned easily. So you are the three things I said that cooking, falsification is manipulation, and plagiarism is actually thiefing or reproducing somebody as your own work without giving the credit. So fabrication is important. It's a serious misconduct, and the data shows that people talked about 1.97% in one meta-analysis. They said they had issues. But, and the 33% did the wrong research. On the other when it was asked about it, they said 14% did it, and 17, nearly three four are actually manipulated to data. So please look at it, very important. This is data fabrication in Japan, and person has to remove from the stem cell research team by the Nobel Road Shinya Yamanaka, has to step down as that lab. 18% of research in Dutch survey falsified fabricated data. Queenland Cancer Research Mark has fabricated data, review find has to be removed. Similarly, hydroxythide start, the man has been behind bar for six years in Germany, fabricating all every data which people started using HES in clinical care leading on to renal failure. Recently, look at COVID-19 Lancet paper was retracted uh, because of falsely showing its advantage and later it turned out to be, it was just a farce. So plagiarism is words, ideas, work, not uncommon, serious. We, if anybody has a plagiarism, it is looked down upon and auto plagiarism, as I talked about in India, chalta hai attitude is there which needs to be stopped. 
And then finally, the methods of plagiarism, if you see, there can be multiple ways it can be there. Copy pasting is the common way with an interval. Then you try to paraphrase active to passive, passive to active. You try to repurpose an idea or a concept from your previous content. And you try to manipulate or take away statistical data from somewhere as it happened with the one sleep paper in API, it has to be retracted. So if you check plagiarism before it is rejected, if it happens later, then they're all withdrawn. So republishing, recycling on academic work without adequate citation will amount to self-plagiarism. UGC has told very clearly, and the same thing is being followed. Now, no research work in universities today can be submitted without a plagiarism check. It has become much easier today to pick it up because of uh, IT. Consequences, you can destroy research as professional academic. I think all of you know, legal repercussions, you lose face, monetary repercussion, and probably you lose also carriers. That is what is happening, general attracts indigenous article. This is in, from the Nagpur University. Similarly, we are seeing other places. If you see, the, a lot of people who have been writing in the newspapers have forgotten to give credit, and, and, and they ultimately have to face, like Zakaria in, in CNN has happened. Redundant, I said duplication of salami. Salami is when you have a one data from you and you start a small, small amount, so it is called salami publication. Duplication is that the things which have been published earlier, you pick up and put it as your own, or you just follow it up, what other has written, the same hypothesis, same methodology, same results and interpretation, then again, it will be coming in that category. Consequences is that it depends on the type, what describe the consequences, they can be blacklisted if institutions, administrative and other decisions, and disciplinary decisions can be taken. So to my dear friends, we should always look for checklists for publication ethics as approval and consent. Data accuracy, falsification, publication should be avoided. Plagiarism, self-plagiarism should not be there. Submission frauds are common that need to be checked. Same as ethics of authorship should be there. Professors must, if they want to have their name, as a corresponding author, give the person who has worked as a first author. That's what we very commonly see in teaching institution. Professors have to learn it that the boy or the girl has worked harder. Conflict of interest should be very clear. And therefore, when you do my dear friend research, either you can become immortalized by like JC Basu or Bose, and also by Sivir Raman, or you can cremate yourself by that professor in critical care what he did it in Germany in HES. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. Dr. Kohli, will we take questions? We'll, 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 uh, the, uh, the speakers will give the answers. Any, any any discussion on your part you can ask no he has narrated it well and brought the concern to the surface which people like to camouflage in both in research publication as well as medical practice he has done justice to the topic the i can only plead on his behalf that all we are in the medical practice I mean, not only need to talk about it, but we need to practice each and every moment that we are with our patients or in our institution. Regarding the publication issue, I mean, uh, as it is not a forum from where we can take the material to the NMC or others, but we should minimize the research as a ground for promotion in uh, yeah, medical hierarchy in institutions. There should be a way of incentivizing people who are into research, but it should not be made mandatory because that is what is all creating the trash research and bringing plagiarism as well as uh, immoral practices in medical research and publications. So as a regulator, um, they have to play their role. We need to take the issues, but they, we cannot uh, guide regulators. It is the different associations who have to come out of the pressures of the pharma industry in the pseudo academics or CME that takes place. 
where these issues of promotion becomes important rather than the content and the topic. I would only suggest to people like Dr. Kohle who are there in India all abroad to take more and more discussion on the and debates on the issues so that the people's mind can be changed and moduled to a manner where malpractices uh, will not be there, GCP will be there, and people will follow ethics beyond law. Thank you. So, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Pandey and uh, Dr. Choudhury for your excellent deliberation. And uh, now we are moving to our next session. The how enter ecosystem change in COVID era. Chairperson is Dr. Pratim Shengupto and speaker is Dr. Ibu Basu. We have seen that the COVID era was a big hurdle in, in many aspects of life, but clinical research continued in spite of all difficulties. The multidisciplinary nature of research, the vastness of the research, and the collaboration of all faced difficulties. However, the silver lining of the entire situation was the leverage of technology, which not only helped to overcome many obstacles, but also opened new vistas for furthering clinical research. Let us hear about how the entire ecosystem changed from our next speaker. The chairperson of this session is Dr. Potim Shengupto, and he is an accomplished nephrologist and renal transplant physician of the country, researcher in the field of nephrology and basic science. Currently, he is a consultant nephrologist and renal transplant physician, Bellevue Clinic and ILS Hospital, Kolkata. In fact, with him, we have worked in many forums and particularly in transplants also, disease organ transplant, we work together. He is the director of MP Birla Medical Research Center. He is a, a president of the Kidney Care Society. He has more than 50 publications in national and international peer review journal, awarded with the best care report award of JAPI 2015. He is also a recipient of Bharat Jyoti Award in 2019. And most important is that he has pioneered an AI-based digital decision-making portal in clinical nephrology. He is a founder member of Society of Renal Nutrition, life member of ISN, ERA, EDTA, TTS, national advisor of NOTO. His continuous leadership and involvement to cadaver organ donation and successful transplantation to a new height in Eastern India. Now I would request Dr. Pratim Shengupto to start the session. Thank you, Dr. Kole, for your uh, very nice and kind introduction. So today we all are uh, really thankful for uh, attending such a beautiful and new uh, kind of uh, webinar because uh, webinars on the clinical research is not very common. And uh, today to enlighten with us regarding the paradigm shift in the research during this COVID time, we have none other than Dr. Riva, Rivu Basu, who is currently felicitating the medical graduates and the postgraduates and integrities in the public health. And uh, after his MD, he has done his MBA in the healthcare management and is currently pursuing the PhD in the field of behavioral economics in the public health. He has worked in the different capacities and uh, in funded projects, especially in the tuberculosis and got numerous publications to his name with a high index of the 10. He has conducted several workshops in the both offline and online modes on the research methods and is working his teams to the leverage online learning and technologies in capacity building. So without delaying time, I'm handing over the session to Dr. Jifu Basu. We love to hear from you the how the entire research uh, ecosystem has been changed in this current crisis situation of the COVID. COVID has hit a lot of things as Suranda already uh, briefed but clinical research is ongoing and I believe it should carry on. And uh, I, I request you to throw light on this enter ecosystem change in the research in this COVID pandemic. Thank you, sir, for your very kind introduction. So am I audible and visible? Oh, okay. If I'm audible and visible, I am starting my presentation then. So, uh, 
firstly uh, i would like to say that if you look at this curve it is starting from march 2020 so that is a very like uh, day which we like to remember when covid was spreading all around the world and it entered india life changed for us but the curve you are looking today is not the curve of covid this is a curve of the increasing number of research publications that have been occurring since then so my friend if you can look at the curve you can see that this is more or less same as the covid curve itself there is a steep in the steep rise of the publications so uh, frankly speaking if you talk about research in covid era volumes of research has increased a lot but something strikes us in spite of so many difficulties so many hurdles the physical distancing the restriction of travel why has this happened so now i am trying to give you a very brief glimpse into why this may happen and why we have been able to leverage technology to overcome much of this so the first thing that comes to our mind when we are doing research is a research ideas i am thankful to the previous speakers and also the following the speakers who will be after me because they shall be discussing about the various aspects of research so the first thing that comes to our mind is the research idea now my friends it is not like archimedes who was uh bathing in a bathtub suddenly some idea came to him and he said eureka and he started walking around the paths naked so it is not like that research ideas are very carefully nurtured ideas that are discussed that are pondered upon that are dissected so we need a lot of people for developing a good research idea because whenever we are doing research now it is very unlikely that we shall be doing research on something which is absolutely new we shall be in fact doing research on something which is already there and we shall probe more and more and more and go to the frontiers of research to get something new so whenever some idea comes to our mind we look into the google we search for the text and we try to go to the frontiers and this requires a lot of planning as the researchers will agree this requires a boardroom with a lot of chairs a white boards presenters and hours and hours of discussing over some snacks and coffees so my friend this was a very brain, uh, deep brainstorming sessions that used to occur in the peak of it times so what has happened to them people have not been able to come the uh, people have been follow, have to follow social distancing so how has this been possible this has been possible because we have been able to leverage technologies now i am sitting in bakuda there are some speakers from new delhi there are speakers from bardhaman there are speakers from kolkata and we have been all able to come together why because these technologies have been there but we never used these technologies but now we have been forced to use these technologies that is why collaboration has become much easier but is this technology there to stay it is there to stay but in many of the webinars there has also been an explosion of webinars in the last two years people often switch off their cameras switch off their mics and they may be strolling they may be sleeping and they just listen or may not listen at all so uh, always this is not a good idea but if we can use the technology properly in a very small group then maybe it is a good place for brainstorming but we have to keep in mind that it can never replace that boardroom effect in which people are intensely concentrating on a particular research idea and trying to develop that so about collaboration this is a uh, diagram from nature so if you can see the um, number of collaborations during the covid era the average number increasing 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 in none of the place we can see india usa has been increasing its collaboration a lot the european countries even kenya but we cannot see india we can see only india in this very small parts so maybe this is time for us to increase our collaboration to remove the red tapism of the institutes of india to build a ecosystem where much easier collaboration can be done with proper ethical and administrative guidelines so that we can go to the top not to the bottom so we have to increase improve the uh, uh, collaboration part and especially now the international collaborations have become easier with all these online modes the next part is official proposal development again the same thing 
if you have developed a proposal, good proposal, you will know that it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of brainstorming to decide the samples, the study populations, the objectives, the tools, etc. has to be, they have to develop very meticulously. That requires a lot of time, uh, brainstorming, brainstorming with the scholars, brainstorming with different experts. Again, this is not there physically, but we have been able to do this in a virtual mode. But something is lacking. Do you know what? We have been not able to do a pilot testing of the proposals. Previously, whenever we developed a questionnaire, we always used to pilot test, go to the field, ask the patients, ask the people about what are the difficulties and the hurdles of the questionnaire. Then we used to come back and recheck the questionnaire. But this physical interaction with the patients and the fields have become extremely difficult in the COVID era because we, have, we can be infected, the patients can be infected. In fact, we have faced several hurdles and barriers from our fields while uh, which we used to go, go and conduct our research in a very fluent manner. But there has been hurdles in the field because of this COVID thing. So uh, on one hand, while getting the experts together has become easier, but going to the field collecting data, we have to be very careful, especially if the research is related to the COVID, we have to be extremely careful so that the investigator doesn't get infected or the investigator doesn't infect the patient. Okay. So in that way, this proposal development and piloting the questionnaire, this has changed during this COVID era. The third point is the conduct of the study. So once we have developed the questionnaire, once we have developed the proposal, once the administrative and the ethical approvals have come, now we are conducting the study. While conducting the study, I want to mention one or two points. Again, the first point is field research. Community-based research has become extremely difficult because of the mistrust on doctors uh, in the communities because uh, they are often thinking that they are wearing masks coming from hospitals, they can spread COVID. These kind of things are there. The mistrust is there in the communities. And on the other hand, if you talk, uh, think of the approvals, the various ethical and administrative approvals, uh, you may think that maybe the approvals are getting delayed because of COVID. And I, I have seen in many places of India, the approvals getting delayed the ethical uh, meetings occurring once in six months and delayed due to COVID. But again, they can be done in an online mode. So in I know of some institutes in West Bengal itself, which are doing regular online ethical meetings. Thus, they are hastening or like uh, making the approvals faster than the previous era. So you can bring out the experts and of the ethical committee together in an online mode and do these approvals in a faster way also if you want. But at the same time, collecting the data from the patients, collecting the data from the field has become extremely difficult. I am telling you another good example. So recently, I was going to, uh, we are uh, doing a project funded by the uh, World NCD Federation. Uh, in that case, we have been able to ask experts for validation of our questionnaire through Delphi method from Canada, USA, Australia by online mode. And we have been able to take opinions of around 70 participants all over India for our study. But they are learned person, they are well accustomed to the technology. So they can use technology well. But most of India cannot use technology well. And they are the most of the bulk of the of our research subjects. So what to do with them? You may think about that. For them, reaching these people are very difficult. You have to go to the field. But I have recently again come across a study by Inclan in which they engaged a research assistant who went to the field while interviewing ASHA workers. They gave the ASHA workers a direct interview for the direct interview with the ASHA workers. They gave them a smartphone. And thus, the researcher in Delhi was able to connect to an uh, ASHA worker in UP or MP by the use of this technology. So, th many things can be done. It is not that things cannot be done to overcome these hurdles, but we have to be very innovative. And to be very frank, we are missing some of the pre-COVID days also. The last part is publication. So uh, Sir has told about publication ethics and all those things. And uh, in publication part, I would say that nothing much has changed. Maybe the publication regarding COVID has increased a lot. I shall show you some very interesting slides. But uh, publication meant more or less collaborating with some people over emails, uh, correcting, submitting the publication, review, answering to the reviewers. This process 
has not much changed during COVID. So whatever ecosystem has changed is before publication part, especially during the collection of data. So I am now show, uh, showing you a very like summary slide. So what has changed? Basically, the face-to-face -face interviews and community data collection, data collection from patients have changed, and these uh, experts uh, together uh, brainstorming part has changed. But we have got technologies in which we can change this uh, or convert the challenges into opportunities with the help of online tools, etc. The other thing I would like to mention, I just forgot mentioning that in the conduct of study is data collection. Nowadays, various uh, if, uh, WhatsApp groups, you may find some link. We are doing a study on this is this from an institute of this and this. Kindly fill up this Google form. It will take only five minutes. So we often do not fill up the form. But this data collection part, especially from some learned audience, has become quite easy with these Google forms and other technologies. But I have got a serious ethical question to Dr. Dhruv. Maybe he can answer later. That suppose in an institute A, an ethical clearance is given on collecting a data or doing a study on some topic. And then a researcher there makes a Google form and sends it to people all around India uh, on other institutes to fill up that form. So whether that is ethically very permissible or not, I have got this uh, query to Dr. Dhruv. Anyways, now let us come to a very lighter part of the presentation. So what is this? Again, some steep curves you can see. So this is actually the research average number of research occurring previously, 2016, 2016, 16. And suddenly, you can see there is a sharp increase of research in the first six months from in 2016 to 2020. And much of this is even not due to the COVID publications. If you look at the num types of research which is occurring during this COVID pandemic, I shall also call it as a publication pandemic or publication epidemic rather, you can see that modeling epidemic is a very favorite topic of all the researchers. You, and very uh, like often you will find some economists or some statisticians or some mathematicians modeling that the COVID will end now, the COVID will end there. And uh, do we like very truly speaking, the epidemiologists will not believe these papers because they know that the uh, problem in the biological systems and the social systems are so very high nobody will be there to uh, comment that this epidemic is going to end here. But they have been publishing loads and loads of paper with various mathematical and statistical techniques on this modeling. Okay. The other papers are on public health. It has increased. So our subject has increased a lot. Something on mental health, diagnostic testing. All this have, we are seeing an epidemic of these kind of papers over the last two years. And if you see the COVID papers versus other papers in as preprints, Okay, something other has happened in the publication domain that is preprints. You will say most of them are COVID papers, fine, but there are other papers also. Why are people using med weeks so much? Because they want to get cited and they know that if they are doing something on COVID, it is more likely that they are going to get published faster. So that is the what I was telling. So whenever you are looking at COVID papers, you are seeing a very fast review. Average acceptance times is very fast. Previously, it has dipped to this point. Now it has increased slightly. So previously, whatever paper you did about COVID would have got a very fast publication. On the other hand, the non-COVID papers are not getting published and have the same, more or less same review time. So that is what I was taking about Meteor Week's pre-publication. Pre so this trend has also come. Around 24% of the uh, papers are being kept as preprints now. This is the last slide. So who is publishing more? So we are Indians who is publishing more. If you look at Indian publications, it was around this part and it has gradually increased, increased, increased. And here it is there. So we from India have not published much. But if you look at United States, it has jumped to this space, uh, part. So maybe uh, we need to publish more. And it is very nice to see that issues like Bellevue are coming forward and organizing these workshops so that we are able to publish and percolate the research in the clinicians also. And I think these institutes will play a very important role in the coming years for contributing to the research ecosystem of India. So the last thoughts is, yes, there are some problems, but we have been able to solve much of those problems by our technologies. And whatever happens later, these technologies will stay and we will be moving towards a blender system of virtual and physical modes. Thank you for your present hearing.
thank you dr nehru for your nice presentations your first slide was fantastic <laughs> the way it was tallied with the mane publication epidemic uh, during the covid time it's really uh, opened our eyes uh, how <clears throat> there is a very uh, hungriness among the researchers all over the world and they utilized the, the crisis of the time to meet their challenges of the obviously it has a some positive impact also showing some throwing some light for understanding such a new disease so i believe uh, uh, dr bibu has nicely covered the majority of the areas uh, the paradigm shift how the technology has helped us and even in the crisis when all the physical modalities and the contact was not possible but we have a good number of very uh, sincere and good quality research during this time and uh, i think we'll take the questions at the end as sort of those daily so we can move to the next topic sort of if you permit so oh, thank you thank you very much dr shin gupto and and dr rihu uh and the participants are requested to send their questionnaires in the chat box and now we are moving to a very important topic study designs speaker is dr a hajra and the chair person is and none other than professor santanu tripathi we all know that the study design is a platform of which entire research is based a successful research may must be based on a carefully selected study design which can be decided based on the type of research being done the pros and cons of these different designs and the applicability of each of these will be discussed by our next speaker dr obhijit haja in this session and now i request professor santanu tripathi to start the session professor tripathi please so good evening everybody and uh, i have the pleasure in introducing professor ovijit hajra uh, who is an accomplished medical teacher he is a professor of pharmacology and dean of student affairs at ipgm er sskm hospital kolkata that is institute of post graduate medical education and research in kolkata so uh, professor hazra is very well known to all of us who are uh, in medical education and in clinical research not just in west bengal but uh, in uh, beyond west bengal also throughout the country he is particularly known for his passion in research clinical research and particularly in research methodologies he has he is an authority and uh, i am fortunate to have him as a colleague and a partner in our research endeavors professor hazra uh, a few just to name a few achievements of his he teaching subject pharmacology to mbs students m bsc in nursing and msc in nursing and other post graduate students for the last 22 years he has been the research guide and super and supervisor to 50 medical students and 5 dm students and 3 phd students till date he has extensive experience in conduct of non oncology clinical trials in drug use surveys adverse drug reaction monitoring and pediatric and neurology observational studies just to give a few examples professor hazra has uh, a huge number of honors and awards and publications to his credit he has published not no less than 160 scientific papers in peer reviewed journals of national repute he has written five books and 10 book chapters professor hazra has uh, been awarded with the ramnath chopra oration of indian pharmacological society in 2016 and he has also uh, delivered the prafulla kumar oration in 2016 again so you all love to hear professor hazra uh, in his scholarly uh, presentations and speeches and here professor hazra has to uh, speak on a topic of which is very close to his heart and that is research designs over to professor hazra 
Thank you, Professor Tripathi. I hope I'm audible to the audience. Yes, yes, you are. Thank you. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here this evening in this workshop on research in clinical practice. We are still in this uh, Corona pandemic, hopefully towards the tail end, but we are confined to our respective domains and we have to meet online. So as Dr. Ribu Vasu was just saying that the research ecosystem has seen some significant changes and some of these changes have been good. Some of these changes have not been so much to our liking, but some of the fundamental concepts of clinical research have not changed. And today I am here to discuss one thing which has not changed and that is research design. Now, this is a fundamental aspect of clinical research and I'm sure that most of you in the audience would be familiar with uh, bits and pieces of it, but let's see if I can put the thing in perspective over the next 20 or 25 minutes. So I'll go on to screen sharing. Just let me know whether you can see my screen. Yes, it is visible. Go okay. Ahead. okay. So, like all other things, clinical research has a particular flow. So, research begins with an idea, a hypothesis in the researcher's mind. This hypothesis has to be crystallized into a research design. Once the research question or idea and the research design are selected, this has to be developed further into a systematic research plan, which we call the study protocol. The study would be conducted as per protocol and the data would then be subjected to analysis. So we see that a research idea, which we can uh, variously call it as a question or a hypothesis comes first and it drives the study design. The protocol is a detailed guide to the study procedures in accordance with the design and it ensures that we are satisfying the scientific principles of research as well as ensuring ethical integrity. Statistical analysis comes at the end. Although we need to formulate a statistical analysis plan as part of the protocol, and analysis does not always ensure that our research question will have been optimally answered. Now, the study design is obviously important. It's important because it translates into study objectives and endpoints. It dictates the type and manner of data collection, as well as it is the basis for formulating the analysis strategy. And we have to do all these things in the hope that whatever question that we have asked, whatever research question that we have posed, we'll be able to reach some valid conclusions, reach some meaningful answers on the basis of all these which have been, which are driven by the research design. So let us begin with a classification of the hierarchy of research design. Now, if you look at clinical research, now we are using the term clinical research. I'm sure that by clinical, we mean human beings, human subjects, but you have to keep in mind that the ambit of the word clinical is actually very wide in scope. It covers not only living human subjects, the subjects can be patients or healthy volunteers. It also covers, let's say, dead human subjects, caregivers. It also covers unborn human subjects. For instance, we could do our researches on embryos and fetuses. It covers human body parts, human body fluids, human tissues, or even simply human medical records. So all of them will come under the ambit of the term clinical. So clinical research is actually very broad in scope, but most of our research questions would be addressed through a handful of study designs. So looking at it, basically, we can classify clinical research designs into two types interventional studies or observational studies to begin with. What is the basis? The basis by which we reach this categorization is that 
if there is an exposure, whether it is decided artificially or it's a natural exposure, if the exposure has been assigned by the investigator, we'll call it an interventional study. But if the exposure is not assigned by the investigator, it comes naturally or is assigned by someone else, the attending physician, for instance, who is not the investigator, then we'll call it an observational study. It is not that we don't have observations in interventional studies. All studies demand observations. And it is not that we can't have interventions in observational studies. There could be interventions, but the basic thing is that the intervention is not decided by the researcher. Now, when we speak of interventional studies, they are popularly called clinical trials, and they're usually prospective in nature. That means they go forward in times. Now, interventional studies would be categorized as randomized and non-randomized studies. What is the basis? In a randomized study, the allocation of subjects to the study arms, that would be done in a manner which is unbiased and which cannot be predicted beforehand. So this process, this process of allocation is called randomization. It's not random or haphazard allocation. It's a randomized allocation. There could be studies where we do not go in for randomized allocation or where randomized allocation is not feasible. We'll call it non-randomized study. For instance, if we are comparing, let's say, a medical treatment versus a surgical intervention, that study will, of course, will not randomize subjects to medical or surgical intervention because the premise may be that only those persons who are unfit for surgery, they will get medical intervention. So randomized clinical studies are in short called RCTs, randomized clinical trials. And for certain good reasons, they're regarded as the gold standard of clinical interventional studies. So remember this, RCT is the gold standard of clinical experimentation. If there is a situation where we can do a randomized study, then we should go in for a randomized study. It is only when randomization is not possible or randomization is unethical or randomization is not feasible, then we can go in for a non-randomized study. Coming to the other R, observational studies. Now, observational studies, now, uh, one more thing has cropped up on that side, if you notice on the screen, that interventional studies, whether randomized or non-randomized, they can be conducted in different ways. And two of the popular ways are parallel group and crossover design studies. We'll come back to this a little later. Now, let us go back to observational studies. Now, observational studies would be categorized as descriptive studies and analytical studies. This is not on the basis that we have a description in a descriptive study, but no description in an analytical study. No, it's not like that. It means that in an observational study, if we have more than one group in which one of the groups we are treating as a reference group or a control group, and then we are comparing between the reference group and the other group, a formal comparison is being made, then we'll call it an analytical observational study or an analytical study in short. Whereas if we consider it as a purely descriptive study without involving comparisons with other groups, only description is involved, then we'll call it as descriptive observational study or in short as a descriptive study. For instance, if I come across some interesting cases, which I feel ought to be reported as a series. So I make a case series report that would qualify as a descriptive study. Because although I'll be summarizing the data of these cases, I will not be comparing, generally speaking, with another case series. So if I make a case report or a case series report, that will come under the umbrella of descriptive studies. Similarly, what we call ecological studies, where we select a group, or we select an exposure and try to define that group or exposure in various ways. We may define in space, we may define in time. 
we may try to define seasonal trends. These are would be called ecological studies, and they're also treated as descriptive studies. Analytical studies, on the other hand, they would be subclassified based upon the temporal relationship between two things. One is exposure and one is outcome. Now, it is important to understand these designs because they make up the bulk of what we call our epidemiological studies, epidemiological studies, and they are of three types. So our analytical observational studies are of three types. Let's begin with the first one. If it happens that we define our groups on the basis of a particular exposure, then we follow up these groups over time. So that's a prospective follow-up. If we follow up these groups over time, looking for a particular outcome, and then at the end of the study, we compare the proportion with the outcome between the exposed and non-exposed group, this is what we know as a cohort study. Suppose we are want to find out what are the adverse effects of cigarette smoking. And we decide that one of the adverse effects that we are interested in is lung cancer. So we follow up a group of patients who are exposed to cigarette smoking. I wouldn't say patients, they're not patients at the beginning, they're subjects. So we follow up a group of patients with this exposure smoking. We also follow up a similar group of subjects. The only difference is that they don't smoke, so they don't have this exposure. And let's say we follow them up for 10 years or 15 years. And at the end of this period, we try to see what is the proportion with lung cancer in the smoker group? What is the proportion with lung cancer in the non-smoker group? And then we try to see whether the, there is a significant difference in proportion. So this kind of study would be called a cohort study. Now let us come to this side. If you proceed in the reverse manner, that means we define groups on the basis of outcome and then look back in time. Retrospective, we look back in time for particular exposures that we are interested in. And then in one group of subjects, whom in this case we'll call the cases because they have a particular outcome of interest, we look back in time and determine what proportion of them have a given exposure. And then we look at another group of subjects who are similar to our cases, but they don't have that particular outcome. So they are not cases, but controls. And we similarly look back in time and see how many have that exposure. And so we compare the proportion with exposure in the case group versus the proportion with exposure in the control group, and then try to see whether there is a significant difference between them. So this is what we call a case control study. However, if we don't have this luxury of going forward in time or going backward in time, forward in time is especially difficult. We have to plan a study which would last for some length of time. We have to keep our team intact. We have to keep our resources intact. We have to have a sufficient budgetary allocation for manpower support. All those things will crop in. And then we have to wait for the outcome. So if we don't have that luxury, we can try to go back in time, look at medical records. But even that will take some bit of time. We have to retrieve the medical records from all the subjects. We have to scrutinize the medical records, ask them to bring back some records if they are missing. If no records are available, we have to interview the subjects and try to find out the missing data on the basis of the recall, which can be a notoriously difficult process. So even this will take some time. So if we don't have such time at our disposal, for instance, when we are doing a postgraduate dissertation work, when we are an MD or MS student and we are trying to do a thesis, and the most time that we have in our hands is at the most one and a half years or 18 months, then what do we do? We select a group of subjects and we try to look at exposure or outcome at the same time. So at the same visit, we interview them, we look at the records, and at the same time, subject them to clinical examination and diagnostic tests. 
So we are simultaneously looking for exposure and outcome at the same point in time or over a narrow window of time. And then we can define groups by exposure and see if there is a difference in outcome, or we can define groups by outcome and see whether there is a difference in exposure. So that kind of analytical observation study would be called cross-sectional study. Sometimes we use the word cross-sectional a little loosely when we mean that we don't have any longitudinal follow. But actually a cross-sectional study means an analytical observational study where we are looking at exposure and outcome at the same point of time or over a narrow window of time. So remember these three study types, these three study designs, cohort study, case control study, cross-sectional study, they're analytical observational studies. They define our epidemiology. So they are the epidemiological studies. The cohort study is the gold standard of epidemiological studies, but it is also the most difficult to organize and perform. If a cohort study is possible, we should go in for a cohort study, but there are situations where there will be logistical limitations, and then we have to depend our case control study and cross-sectional study, and we have to carefully consider the shortcomings of these studies and try to actually conduct the study in such a manner that these limitations can be either overcome or they do not become a serious confounder in analyzing the study result. So in this one slide, you now have the basic hierarchy of clinical study designs. So today we won't go further into epidemiological studies, but we'll try to look at some more aspects of interventional study. Now, if you look at this slide, these are some general principles which are very important to remember when we select our study design and sit down to write a protocol. Our design needs to be tailored to objectives. It is possible that some objectives may be met optimally through a particular design, but other objectives cannot be addressed optimally through that design. So either we change the design or we customize the objectives to suit them to the design. The same question may be tackled through alternative designs. For instance, the example that we gave you, the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, can it be tackled through a case control design? Can it be tackled through a cross-sectional design? Now, it turns out that the same research question may be tackled through an alternative designs, and it would depend upon the resources which are at the researcher's disposal. So what we say popularly, what are the four M's at our disposal? The four M's being man, money, materials, and perhaps the most important M is time or minutes at the researcher's disposal. No design is perfect. No design would give a perfect answer to all or most of your research question. So there will always be shortcomings in an individual design. There will always be alternative designs by which you could have answered a particular objective better. But the design that we have to choose and we have to justify to our ethics committee, we have to justify to our funding agency, and we have to justify to our editors and reviewers when we write down the research paper at the end of the study, is that why we have selected a particular design given our constraints of man, money, materials, and minutes. Now look at the type of research questions that we ask ourselves in clinical study. So questions may pertain to therapeutic effectiveness, questions may pertain to diagnosis of disease, questions may pertain to screening, screening of disease, sort of preliminary diagnosis of disease. Questions may pertain to prognosis or outcome in the short term, long term, or questions may pertain to etiology and causation. Now, what kind of designs are considered feasible or optimal for each of these questions? If you look at, then barring the first question, questions of therapeutic effectiveness, all other questions actually require epidemiological studies of which questions of diagnosis and screening 
are often addressed to simple cross-sectional studies, but questions of prognosis, causation, risk factor associations, they will have to be addressed through more elaborate epidemiological studies in the form of cohort or case control. However, when it comes to questions of therapeutic effectiveness, okay, not necessarily always uh, drugs, it could mean uh, vaccines, it could mean surgical procedures, it could mean lifestyle modifications. When it comes to questions of therapeutic outcome or effectiveness, then the RCT, the randomized control trial is always considered as a gold standard. Now, let us delve a little bit into the various variants of the control trial. And we have tried to depict them periodically. If you look at the first term, where you can see actually we don't have a comparator group. We start with a group of subjects. So at the baseline, we take some time depicted by the black portion of the bar, where we need this time to confirm the disease, to diagnose the disease state, to make sure that the subjects are willing to participate in this trial. And then we begin our treatment. And at the end of a suitable time period, we try to see how much of them, how much, what proportion of the subjects have achieved a particular endpoint. So this single treatment design actually is a non-comparator design. So in most circumstances, this design will not be accepted. However, it may still be accepted in a very few select situations. For instance, suppose you claim that you have a medicine which is effective in rabies. Now with rabies, we know that there would be a 100% fatal disease. Now, if you say that you would randomize subjects to two arm, in which one arm would receive a treatment which has shown great promise in our preclinical studies, and in the other arm will not offer anything, not just simple placebo, then this might not be acceptable to the patients, it might not be acceptable, or it will not be acceptable to the ethics committee that reviews your protocol. So single treatment studies still have their place in selected cases, but scientifically, they are a little bit of concern because you can always attribute any favorable treatment outcome to chance rather than any real effect of the intervention. The two most widely used interventional study designs, of course, I'm sure all of you know, the parallel group designs and the crossover designs. In the parallel group, after a short run-in period, we randomize subjects to whatever number of arms here for simplicity's sake, uh, two arms are shown. So the two arms continue to receive the treatment in parallel. And after a reasonable length of time, we stop the study and look for difference in endpoint between the two arms. The crossover study starts off like a parallel group study, but then after a time, the treatment is switched between groups. So, Treatment arm A is switched to treatment arm B, and treatment arm B is switched to treatment arm A. The switch does not occur instantaneously in time, but we need a short, what is called run-in period between this crossover to ensure that we do not have, we are not having a carryover effect of the earlier treatment. So each of these designs, they have their own pros and cons. For instance, if we are speaking about cure as an endpoint. It's an antibiotic which is expected to cure an infection. So obviously we cannot use a crossover design. They are more suited for diseases which run a chronic and stable course. Whereas parallel group design, we can jolly well use where we have a very well-defined endpoint like a cure. There are some other interventional study designs which are less common. For instance, withdrawal design. It may so happen in a particular situation that it is anticipated that a quite a large number of subjects may be non-responders. One concrete example is this medicine anti-obesity drug called Orlistat. Uh, almost 60% of the subjects may be non-responders and it's a relatively expensive treatment. So why keep patients or subjects on a treatment in which many of them would be non-responders? So what is done? in a withdrawal design, 
all patients are initially given the medicine in question and those who are non responders are identified and they are pulled out of the study and the remaining responders they are now randomized so one arm continues with the original treatment and the other arm is given a comparator treatment so this is called a withdrawal design then we have what is called a factorial design where we can see the interaction between two treatments or we can see the interaction between different doses of two treatments and we, if we have two treatment levels in a factorial design we'll have four study arms so it's good for testing interactions between treatments then we have more complicated designs such as survival uh, study designs which are traditionally employed in cancer studies where subjects can reach endpoints other endpoints rather than the one intended for instance in a study which is relatively long term where we can have death from cancer as our endpoint in question some people may die from competing causes that means non cancer related causes large proportion of subjects may drop out of the study so all these sorts of complications would arise and there we need special study designs and special type of analysis to tackle these situations and these are called survival designs so what are the factors there are more study designs i have not gone through all of them and nowadays you'll find a term every now and then cropping up in literature which is called adaptive designs which means the researchers do not fix all aspects of the study design at the beginning because the area may be relatively new or uncertain but they adapt the design subsequently as they go along it's not that the whole study design is changed but certain aspects may be adapted depending upon the circumstances that are evolving so what are the factors that we have to consider in a study design selection to recapitulate our study objectives time frame treatment duration carry over effects cost and logistics patient convenience and also we have to remember the statistical expertise available at our disposal if we choose very complicated designs if we choose large adaptive designs we not we, we not may ah, may not have the expertise to analyze this data at the end then there is something interesting called the group allocation design which means that the intervention is applied to groups of similar subject rather than to in individual subjects so intervention applied to entire community instead of individual patient so if we are comparing the outcomes of different hospitals clinics outcome which is seen at public places etc we can choose this group allocation designs and some of the important informations that we have obtained from group allocation design studies are the effects of smoking cessation weight control exercise program the effect of giving access to of to paramedical workers to defibrillators uh, media comparisons to get people to act quickly if experiencing heart attack symptoms so these kinds of relatively simple endpoints where we have seen the results coming out of studies which have randomized these outcomes to groups of subjects rather than at the individual subject levels okay then we have this mega trials trials which involve not just 100 but thousands of patients so these mega trials they aim to give quick answers to really important public health issues where individually the effects may not be very frequent but we can have composite endpoints for instance in cardiovascular studies where they use a composite endpoints of uh fatal myocardial infarction non fatal myocardial infarction and fatal uh, fatal stroke these kinds of endpoints where they combine different endpoints and arrive at a composite endpoint the disadvantages of such mega studies is you cannot go into very fine distinctions you can only study common diseases where hard endpoints where there won't be much subjectivity involved in deducing this endpoint and you don't look at too many secondary objectives and the other disadvantage is the larger your study becomes the more difficult 
is to ensure quality. So quality assurance and quality control becomes a problem. So the greatest enemy of clinical trials is something called bias, which simply means any error. And there are hundreds of possible sources of bias in a clinical study. Bias, some of the major ones which comes is from the patients being treated, the clinical staff administering or assessing the treatment, or even the statistician analyzing the treatment. So all these can confuse the result and lead to a wrong interpretation of the study or sometimes an entirely different finding from what is actually happening in reality. So for all clinical studies, we need several bias handling measures. So this is a list of the many different biases and some of them even come after the end of the study. Publication bias, for instance, but uh, uh, I'll not go into this individual kinds. This is just to give you an idea of the many different sources of confounding or misrepresentation or error in clinical studies. So what are the things that we adapt to try to eliminate bias or to reduce bias? Things like use of control group, careful selection of inclusion exclusion criteria, standardized diagnosis protocol, standardized conduct of study procedures, meticulous observation measurements, careful data capture, and statistical analysis according to a plan defined a priori before we go into actual data collection itself. So I'm sure you are at least familiar with the basics of this term. So control group really means comparators, and we can have different kinds of comparators in the clinical study. In a single arm trial, we don't really use a comparator, but the scope of these trials are limited. We use placebos as comparators, but there are ethical issues associated with the use of placebo. So we try to see if we can have some standard treatment as an active control comparator. Sometimes we do a dose response type of studies where we use different doses of the same intervention and occasionally, occasionally we can use data from studies being done outside our own immediate purview or even studies which have already been completed and reported in literature as a control, which are so-called external or historical controls. And the other major bias reducing measure that we use in clinical research is to conceal the exact identity of treatment. So a process which is called blinding. Now, since ophthalmologists are objecting to this term, we are switching over to masking. So masking prevents patients, investigators, and assessors from getting influenced by the identity of the treatment. And it also reduces the opportunity to, for bias to confuse the evaluation of the results. So they can reduce different kinds of biases, such as performance, assessment, reporting, analysis, bias, etc. And there are three levels of blinding. If we don't use any sort of blinding, we call it an open label study. If we ensure that the patient is unaware of the identity of the treatment, we call it a single blind study. If both patient and the investigator who is observing the results, they are unaware, we call it double blind study. And finally, if we also keep the statistician or the data analysis unaware of the exact identity of the treatment, we'll be having a triple blind study. Now, blinding has its ways and means of being done and allocation concealment also has different strategies. So although blinding may sign, sound very appealing, scientifically, it the greater the level of blinding, the more reliable the results, but there are many practical difficulties in implementing blinding in clinical research, particularly in long-term studies. So this is an example of the popular double dummy technique, which we use when we go in for double blinding where our active treatment and comparator, here written as test drug and placebo, they are not similar and can be discerned by perceptible patients. So what we use, we use two treatments in each treatment arm. In one group, one of the treatment is active, the other is the dummy. In the other group, it is the other way around. So we require two dummies to achieve double blinding. So this is the 
double dummy technique of double blinding. So whenever we do blinding, we need procedures to break the blind. So we have to break the blind in such a manner that if something unward, untoward happens to the patient and they have to be given rescue treatment or emergency treatment, the treating physician is made aware of the identity of the treatment which the particular patient was re, uh, receiving without breaking the blind for the entire study. So this itself is an area of a uh, very technical area where lots of discussions can take place, how to ensure proper blinding in clinical research. Finally, we come to the first word in our city, randomization. So we have already said what it is to recapitulate. It's a process by which subjects are allocated in a manner which ensures that each subject has an equal chance of receiving one or other of the treatments being evaluated, thereby minimizing certain kinds of bias. Again, saying that randomization does not mean random allocation. There is a process to it. Okay. Randomization circumvents the natural tendency of physicians to select the perceived best treatment for their patients. An observed differences in treatment outcome may really be the result of differences in baseline factors rather than therapy. Randomization ensures that such factors get equally distributed between the treatment groups with the end result that the conclusions we are drawing, they are scientifically valid. So this is the reason for randomization and there are different strategies for randomization, simple randomization, stratified randomization, block randomization, cluster designs and adaptive randomization. So we are not going into the details of this. Today's session is one of overview. So finally, before closing, we have, let me tell you that there are two words in clinical research regarding the outcome. One is the efficacy trials and the effectiveness trials. Efficacy trials show that an intervention can work. Effectiveness trials evaluate interventions in the settings where they will be applied. So efficacy trials are more aptly describing the early phase clinical trials the studies are conducted either on healthy volunteers or very carefully selected groups of patients without lots of comorbidities or without any comorbidities at all. Effectiveness studies refer to later phase clinical trials, typically phase three trials, where interventions are applied at the community level to patients with lots of different variations in baseline factors and with different kinds of comorbidities. And just like we see that interventions are often less effective in clinical settings than in the laboratory, similarly we see that interventions are often less successful in effectiveness studies than in efficacy trials. So this is one more reason that we sometimes need design changes depending upon our goal of the study, whether it's to show efficacy or to show effectiveness. So, for those of us who are fortunate enough to be in the field where we can do clinical research, we have to keep in mind that worthwhile clinical research requires different sets of skill. We require design or sampling skill, we require observation measurement skill, data management skills, analysis interpretation skills, and finally writing and communication skills. Now, if you can acquire and develop all these skills within yourself, there is nothing better than that. But personally, I feel that one lifetime is not enough to be an expert of all these different kinds of skills. And so the only way we can participate in worthwhile clinical research is to work as a team. It's always a team game. So with this, I'll risk my case. I'll stop my slide sharing and hand the session back to the chairperson. Over to you, Professor Tripathi. Thank you very much, Dr. Hazra. And, uh... It was wonderful as ever, and uh, it is quite comprehensive at the same time in very, very simple language so that uh, I'm sure that it has been very useful, particularly for the beginners. And, uh, and also some of the seniors, I have seen that uh, sometimes even as basic as distinguishing between observational and interventional research sometimes becomes a little tricky. 
and uh, many a time sitting in the ethics committee we have seen that uh, but then uh, with your clear expression and uh, of the slide set we have done a wonderful justice to the topic that has been assigned i don't think there is any need for any further clarification and time is also uh, is not going to permit us so with this i uh, profusely thank professor hazra for the thank wonderful you. presentation and uh, i can now hand over to dr shorab kole for uh, further proceedings of the today's webinar over thank you over to dr shorab kole thanks thanks dr hajra and and, and dr uh, tiparthi uh, for this excellent session and uh, our next session is on the research methods research methods our chairperson is dr subrajyoti bhomik and our speaker is dr pranita tarobdar as we all know that the appropriate research method has to be selected for any research which can suitably address the research question these methods of can be qualitative or quantitative research methods in nature one quantitative methods include interviews questionnaires focus group discussion while quantitative research method includes surveys polls and sampling methods the various aspects of research methods will be addressed in this session by speaker dr pranita tarobdar now the session will be chaired by dr shubhajyoti bhomik Uh, he has completed his md in pharmacology from ipgm and kolkata and over 14 years of experience in the field of research he has a certification in clinical research administration and project management from stanford university usa and in patient safety from john hopkins university usa he is an assessor for the national accreditation board for hospitals and healthcare providers in india he has been the uh all of the sputnik we vaccine trial in eastern india and has published systemic review of covid-19 medications like remdesivir fevipiravir etc he is currently the clinical director of academics medical quality and clinical research in peerless hospital and bikera research center kolkata over to dr bhomik please thank you dr kole for that wonderful introduction good evening ladies and gentlemen and at the outset let me thank the organizers especially dr pradeep singh gupta dr anuradha agarwal and dr saurav kole for this invitation to chair this important session our speaker today is a distinguished faculty uh, to introduce the speaker professor dr pranita dorovdar graduated from the calcutta national medical college in 1991 she did her postgraduate studies from the prestigious all india institute of hygiene and public health in kolkata and has been the university topper of her batch dr tarovdar is a committed public health specialist with numerous national and international publications to her credit she's now the professor department of community medicine at the west bengal medical education service with teaching experience of more than 20 years uh, professor tarovdar over to you for the discussion on research methods which is a very important topic on how to collect data to make it more appropriate for the study professor tarvdar please good evening thank you so much i know we are uh, uh, running behind uh, time so i would like to keep my presentation uh, very uh, short and uh, i would like to thank uh, professor dr hajra for his excellent uh, presentation and i would like to continue uh, with that so just a minute so regarding the different research methods is the screen visible yes it is visible please go ahead yes yes okay. you are audible and it's visible please thank go ahead. you so much thank you so <clears throat> outbreaks like covid 19 have drawn attention to the importance of epidemiology and epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of health and illness among the specified population and the application of the study to control the health problems so we all know that epidemiology predominantly is a quantitative science because it deals with numbers so researchers work to define an outbreak find cases generate rates of illnesses and develop and evaluate hypothesis 
about the cause of illness and how it is how it can be controlled so <clears throat> as we have discussed before the uh, previous speaker has said that the studies can be non intervention and intervention so in the non intervention studies we have exploratory studies descriptive studies and analytical studies so what is an exploratory study it is a small scale study of a short duration carried out where little is known about the situation or problem so this is typically true for this covid 19 pandemic it can include a description as well as a comparison for example a national aids control program wants to establish counseling services for hiv positive and aids patients but lacks information on specific needs the patients have for support so to explore these needs a number of in depth interviews can be held with various categories of patients like males females married singles with counselors because we know that the needs for men will be different from that of women so if the problem and its contributing factors are not well defined it is always advisable to do an exploratory study first before embarking on a large scale or descriptive or comparative study so we know about the descriptive studies already discussed they have they will describe the disease by time place and person and examples are case reports case series cross sectional studies and ecological studies and next we have the analytical studies analytical studies can be comparative cross sectional studies case control studies and cohort studies and interventional studies that is experimental and quasi experimental studies so first what study to decide the what study design to decide so we ask a question has the investigator assigned exposures if the answer is no then it means it is an observational study is there a comparison group is the next question if the answer is yes then it is an analytical study if there is no comparison group it is a descriptive study next if the answer is yes it is an analytical study so what is the direction is it from exposure to outcome yes it is a cohort study is it from out outcome to exposure then it is a case control study and if if exposure and outcome are at the same time occurring and there is a comparison group so it is an analytical cross sectional study now the other side that is did the investigator assign exposures the other arm yes the answer is yes so then it is an experimental study now has random allocation been done yes then it is a randomized control trial no random allocation so it is a non randomized control trial or a quasi experimental study now research methods can be qualitative as well as quantitative so epidemiological data give us information about who is affected by the disease how the disease works who survives who dies from the illness but quantitative epidemiological models miss out on the social implications of the disease they are not well suited to capture the reasons for the people's behavior the social interactions or the ways people make sense of what is happening around them and the best example of this is covid 19 it has taught us the importance of both qualitative as well as quantitative research so qualitative methods are valuable along with the traditional quantitative methods they focus not just on what but on how for example we know that we should wear masks but there are people give multitude reasons of not wearing masks okay so when there are some behaviors like slipping off the mask while speaking so this a qualitative method will focus on not only what or how many on the numbers but also on why and for what reasons what is the reason for the behavior of the people so it will help explain the gap between assumptions in epidemiological models as well as realities as to why certain outbreak interventions work some outbreak interventions fail hmm? so for example 
on 25th december in park street we saw the huge crowd in spite of uh, two waves preceding us so how were they behaving without masks so this a quantitative research will not give us the answer to this but it will be given by a qualitative research so uh, can you see the whole slide this has to be minimized uh, for example uh, see the slide this. is visible the slide is visible so covid 19 is not just a medical pandemic there are many factors so it is a pandemic which is disrupting the social order so here we see the different factors are the dynamics of the virus which is always changing the testing where people are reluctant to test and also the testing itself is overwhelmed that we are overburdened with the uh, uh, huge load of testing there is infection there is immunity which can be innate immunity as well as immunity acquired by vaccination or immunity acquired by infection along with that improvements in clinical care vaccines along with that inequalities and anxieties so we have to see the social factors which are affecting the disease and the interaction with each of these factors how the social factors and the behavioral factors how they are responsible so people there are some essential contributions of qualitative methods during epidemics number one people's health behaviors do not always fit into neat epidemiological models so currently health leaders are advising people to have social distancing and quarantine but qualitative studies show that many different complex psychological and cultural factors they limit compliance hmm? for example people are living in a slum in an overcrowded place how can they do social distancing how can they have isolation how can they have quarantine okay also there can be a mistrust in the government or a history of use or perception of use of quarantine as a control mechanism next is the vulnerable population so the vulnerable population is not only the biological vulnerable but also socially vulnerable so qualitative methods can shed light on the needs of particularly marginalized groups during health crisis and infections or chronic illness epidemics so there are different ways the virus can hurt the vulnerable people like the poor families huh? or people who uh, eat the take home ration from the schools so in incarcerated populations populations who are uh, say living in jails they cannot socially distance themselves or people in slums can they cannot do social distancing or uh, where the access to sanitation also is very poor so there also isolation becomes a problem next is unexpected consequence or surprising outcomes qualitative methods are well suited to exploring the reasons that of the epidemics and uh, solutions and the strategies which work or fail and covering the unexpected consequences of actions during the epidemic so qualitative research focuses on the depth quantitative research focuses on the numbers for example early fears contributed to shortage of masks and sanitizers for the medical personnel also there was a sense of uh, isolation due to social distancing and that affected the mental health of the people next is the medical response experiences in previous outbreaks similar in nature to covid like h1n1 sars ebola qualitative approaches have been key accompaniments to traditional quantitative outbreak investigations and this highlights the need for medical and other first responders and their interactions with the affected communities it uncovers challenges like limited testing availability difficulty in identifying persons with covid-19 based on signs and symptoms reluctance to report the illness fears of social isolation limited treatment options so all these are medical uh, experiences and to understand these if we can uncover these challenges we can explore these challenges by qualitative methods next is getting community participation 
public health solutions and tools are only effective when people use them. So community participation is essential for the success of any program. So qualitative methods can help uncover assumptions underlying the public health plans and signal the need to plan with communities and engage communities and groups and individual discussions. So qualitative methods can explore how people will react to the uncertainty and disconnection that accompany measures like isolation and quarantine. How medicines and supplies can be transported, received and stored in faraway locations. So next, if we compare quantitative versus qualitative research methods, we see that Quantitative focuses on numbers, but qualitative focuses on the narrative, that is the text. The view of the world in quantitative is social. It is objective, measurable, and external to the individual. Whereas in qualitative, it is the social reality subjectively interpreted and experienced by them. The logic of inquiry in quantitative is deductive, where we test the hypothesis. We test and see whether there is any relationship or not in the hypothesis. But here, qualitative, it is inductive. So we understand the processes which are derived from the data. Research design ensures repeatability, but here we interpret the response. And the validity we see here in quantitative, it is objective, but in qualitative, it is subjective. The cross-cultural generalizations we see applications of the same observation method to different cultures is possible in quantitative because it is the science of numbers and we are taking a uh, random and representative sample. But in cross-cultural generalization is not always possible in qualitative. That requires conversion in abstract and cultural uh, categories. Next is the focus. The focus is that the questions are focused in quantitative, but in qualitative, they are open-ended. So we get a wide range of answers in case of qualitative research. But in quantitative, we have a, a set of questions and generally the uh, different options are given. So here, the quantitative, generally we have close-ended questions, but in qualitative, we have open-ended questions. So that is the reason why in qualitative research, it is exploratory and the depth is more and we get we can get unlimited answers, unlimited explanations. So the focus on <coughs> in quantitative is on causal relationships and statistical significance that explain or predict the phenomenon and measure the effect of intervention. But here in qualitative, we have the lived experiences of the individuals, groups, cultural factors, and the meaning of the phenomenon. Sample size in quantitative, it has to be a proper estimated sample size, which is generally large, random, representative. And uh, in, in case of uh, intervention, it has to, there has to be blinding. But in qualitative, it is a small purposeful sample, sometimes emergent selection or serial selection. The setting in quantitative is controlled by design, but in qualitative, it is natural, uncontrolled. Data in quantitative is numerical, measurable, collected only from the subjects. But in qualitative, we have wide variety of data. It is observation, text, narrative, visual, photographs, audio recording, and also the interpretation of the individual researchers as well as the participants. So researchers are also providing data, not only the participants, but in quantitative, only the participants are giving the data. The analysis is in quantitative by descriptive or inferential statistics, whereas in qualitative, we develop themes. So it is thematic, narrative, content, and analytic procedures. So when do we use quanti qualitative research methods? When we want to view social phenomena holistically, suitable vocabulary not available to communicate with respondents, subject matter is unfamiliar, we need to explore and explain certain behaviors, provide insight into the meanings on decisions of actions, 
and seek a depth in understanding. So under these circumstances, we will use qualitative research methods. So what are the different methods? It can be, if they are mainly data collection methods are in-depth interviews, focus group discussions, and participant observation. So these are, uh, all these require partnership between participant and investigator. And investigator is the instrument in the research process, learner and co-interpreter. And it is iterative rather than fixed and interpretive and open-ended, emergent rather than pre-structured. So the different types are, one is the in-depth interview, they are open-ended interviews, discover the interview's own framework meaning and obtains rich contextualized in-depth information. Avoid imposing the researcher's structures and assumptions. The technique is there is an interview guide that is probing, reflecting on remarks made by the informant and collects the respondent's perspectives and words. The level of structure varies. But when to use it? When there is a complex subject matter and knowledgeable respondents, highly sensitive matter, geographically dispersed respondents, and peer pressure is an issue. Either social, desi social desirability is a threat. Next is the focus group discussion. So focus group discussions are open-ended group interviews. They promote discussions between participants on specific topics, usually six to eight. Similar participants, like a group of mothers, can ha have a focus group discussion. Similar age, gender, socioeconomic status, education. For example, a group of nurses can have a focus group discussion on the problems in the workplace. Similar cognitive structures, similar perceptions of the social environment. There is a moderator and note taker and flexible interview guide. So when to use this? When the group interaction is important. Cost and timing issues are there. Idea generation, problem identification and definition. Identify local group specific vocabulary or terminology and evaluating an intervention. So there are some advantages of FGDs. Some people are more com comfortable and talk more openly in groups. It is a natural people for some people to talk about problems and personal issues in some cultures. So we get the information from the group, huh? collects information on social norms and gives a lot of data in a limited amount of time. But it is not generalizable. This is the disadvantage. Difficult to ac uh, access the practice of very personal or sensitive behaviors. And there are some people who are very dominant in a group. So they will dominate people. Other people who are shy may not participate. Sensitive to bias analysis and very time consuming. So this transcripting time is very time consuming and it is a big analytical challenge. Another type is participant observation, where the researcher becomes the participant in the social event. So advantage is the data is very deep and detailed, but disadvantage is difficult to systematically connect, especially in the middle of important uh, meeting, hard to take notes, so details may be forgotten. So I will not go into the qualitative data analysis. Uh, there are types, different types of analysis. I'm skipping this. But how to use qualitative research methods? So qualitative research method can be used as a tool to generate ideas, a preliminary step before developing a quantitative study. So first, we can have a qualitative study. We generate the different themes, explore the subject, formulate important themes, and then this is followed by the quantitative data, and then we get the result. This is one method. One use. Next use is to help understand the results of a quantitative study. So it is the opposite. That is, first we are doing a quantitative study and then we are following it up with a qualitative study. For example, use of masks in COVID. We know that N95 masks will prevent transmission and there can be quantitative studies regarding the use of masks and the risk 
in uh, reduce risk of transmission and qualitative part will be why people are not wearing the mask properly why they are not using the mask in spite of uh, ic and in spite of knowing the risk associated with not use of mask and then we can get a better understanding of the topic <clears throat> the primary <clears throat> data collection method <clears throat> it may be sometimes but not necessary along with the quantity study so sometimes it can be primary so that is both qualitative and quantitative and then we get a result this is called mixed method approach so both qualitative and quantitative together in the same study and this is now uh, being used and it is uh, uh, in vogue now that is a mixed model approach mixed method approach so no single method adequately solves the problem of rival uh, explanations and we have to have multiple sources followed by triangulation of data so how is quality how are qualitative research methods useful they identify the health determinants by underlying the behavior attitude perceptions they shed light on the success of intervention why some interventions are successful why some are not why in spite of giving uh, providing insecticide treated bed nets for prevention of malaria people are not using them hmm? so why some interventions are successful some are not next is they facilitate the understanding of the policy social and legal context in which decisions are made and explain the social and pragmatic impediment to inform choices and useful choices use of services so <clears throat> with this I want to uh, give this take home message that we use qualitative research methods to explore and ask why and seek depth in understanding. So in conclusion, qualitative methods are the best methods for capturing social responses to this pandemic, give insight to the current situation, help to understand how people make meaning and sense of health and illness, play a pivotal role in understanding effective solutions and strategies, position to explore the plurality of expertise and diversity of perspectives necessary to understand fully the COVID-19 pandemic as it unfolds. So it provides lessons for future epidemics and how to effectively manage them. So many researchers combine qualitative and quantitative approach, and this is called the mixed method approach. So with this, I thank you all for inviting me and I conclude my presentation. Thank you, Professor Tarabdar, for that wonderful uh, discussion on what is what are the different methods. And because we are running short of time, we would close this session. I would request the participants to send the questions in the question box over to Dr. Shorab Pule for the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Punita Tarobdar and Dr. Subhajyoti Bhomik. And uh, <coughs> participants, if you have any question, you can send to the chat, chat box. And now we are going to our, our next session, importance of research in COVID era. We are very fortunate that Dr. Guleria, Director of AIMS, New Delhi, will be delivering this lecture. And uh, we all know that the ever growing emphasis of clinical research and its application in, in, in various aspects of knowledge and practice of modern medicine in our daily lives can never be sufficiently stressed upon. A clinician should have the approach of a curious baby who is looking the world over immersed with a glitch ready to learn everything. In the present COVID era, this ever inquisitiveness is, is essential to delve into the little known aspects of this lethal disease and how vastly it has affected all aspects of our lives. By immensing ourselves for the research, we'll save the lives and livelihoods of innumerable people. Obviously, our next speaker, Dr. Guleria, will emphasize the importance of research in this difficult COVID area. And the session will be chaired by Dr. Bibhuti Shaha. He is a professor and head of the Department of Tropical Medicine. He is a member of the Research and Development Expert Committee, the medical science, including the public health government of West Bengal. 
Now over to Dr. Bibhuti Shah, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kole, for giving me this opportunity to chair this important session. And <clears throat> we are going to uh, listen from and none other than Dr. Randeep Guleria, who is the director of uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, Dr. Guleria is a uh, MD in medicine and he is a first DM in pulmonary medicine in India. And he has done many accolades to his department of pulmonary medicine. He has received many awards, including the Padma Sri by the government of India in 2015, and also the BCRA National Award for the, for the year 2014 in the category of eminent medical persons. And he also was awarded the Legends category, the Doctor of the Decade Award by the Indian Medical Association and the National Excellence Award by the T.P. Junjanawala Foundation in 2017-18. And he's also the member of the National Task Force of Government of India for COVID-19 and the member of the Empowered Group 2 created by the Prime Minister's Office for Multisectorial Management of COVID-19. And we know that there has been a deluge of research in this COVID-19 era most of this has been good. We have got the recovery trial telling us the use of steroids. There have been trials on the use of anticoagulants and other uh, things. And also there have been some research which has not stood the stand of time. And to take us through all of this is we have Professor Guleria. So over to you, sir, for your kind deliberation. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you very much. At the onset, let me really congratulate the organizers for holding this uh, webinar on research methodology, something which is uh, usually not discussed and not uh, very popular among clinicians. Uh, I'll just be over the next 10-15 minutes uh, giving my thoughts uh, as far as research during COVID-19 is concerned. Now, if you look at research during COVID-19, I could broadly split it into two broad areas, non-COVID related research and COVID related research. If you look at non-COVID related research, that has suffered a lot because of the pandemic. And uh, even if you look at data from the clinical trials registry, more than 2000 uh, clinical trials had to be stopped because of the pandemic. And we all have seen that our researchers across the world, including individuals have seen the challenges that one had to face uh, because of the lockdown, because of the stigma, and because of the entire focus being put on COVID-19. Many trials uh, had to be halted. We were doing two trials, and I'll just give an example of that. One was on air pollution, which was an international trial funded by MRC and Department of Science and Technology. And we were looking at the effect of air pollution in asthmatic children and pregnant women. And uh, we had uh, devices that they could wear on themselves, so they could be personal monitoring devices for pregnant women and for asthmatic children. But, uh, but while we were midway through this project, the uh, pandemic hit us and we could not really recruit more patients. We could not continue the trial in pregnant women or asthmatic children because of the fear of the pandemic. And that had to be curtailed and uh, limited data analysis was only possible. We were also doing another trial which was sponsored by ICMR and which was a multi-centric trial on uh, tuberculosis vaccination. And this was looking at uh, the close contacts of sputum positive TB patients to vaccinate them and to see whether we could prevent uh, infection happening from them. Again, it was a field project. Uh, the researchers, the, the field, the uh, research staff had to go to uh, uh, their house and enroll patients and give them the vaccine or the placebo. But that also could not uh, do very well. And we are now restarted uh, starting that to some extent but these are the challenges that one faced and this is just to give you a few examples that covid itself really led to a lot of non covid research suffering many phd programs had to be delayed and many students actually who were doing high end research which was, could be lab based were not able to do so so looking at the second part that is research due to, for covid that really picked up in a huge manner and I think there we need to really look at the quality versus the quantity because there was a huge increase in the quantity of research that was being done. But if you ask me critically to look at all the research that was being done, there was some degree of compromise as far as quality was concerned. And I think what we would need to do is when we look at a pandemic, have ethics committee to work over time to clear projects early rather than late as what was being done in the past. Have uh, project review committees which can review projects and see whether they are 
the, the study is designed is good. They're answering a question. The research hypothesis is good. Unless we do that, a large amount of research would be done, but it may not have that much of value when you look at it in the long run. And that led to what I would say is the era of preprint. We had huge number of articles coming on into the preprint. Uh, I think more than 10,000 articles currently are there in preprint waiting for peer review and publication. And therefore, the pandemic did lead to a lot of research papers being uh, put out there. But the quality of research is something that we need to really be very clear about. There is definitely a need for research during pandemic. I think this is something that we need to do. We at AIMS actually, way back two years ago in uh, March itself, created an intermural fund. We gave our own uh, money from our own uh, resources to uh, promote research on COVID. And we called for proposals. We did a very rapid uh, ethical review and also had a committee which had experts from uh, outside AIMS to review the projects and see which were good for funding. And we did give some support so that this could be the seed money while uh, they could get some extra mural funding. So the institutes will have to develop strategies to promote researchers because pandemic throws different challenges which would not be present during a non-pandemic time. There's also a need to really understand that the research that was being done was in the early days not of that good quality and that led to the use of various drugs like hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, data or a paper which came out from Bangladesh tried to show that ivermectin was very effective and therefore it became uh, very popular in the developing world. Uh, the same story is basically as far as hydroxychloroquine is concerned and it was actually even promoted all the way up to the US as a drug which could be a game changer as far as treating COVID-19 is concerned. But then gradually, multicentric, good quality trials started coming up and WHO got also involved and there were multiple countries, including India, which got involved in various drug trials to try and see whether we could first look at what would be repurposed drugs for the treatment of COVID-19. And secondly, what could be newer antivirals that could be looked at. Uh, this led to, as was mentioned, the utility of steroids being established in moderate to severe disease. Uh, no utility in mild disease. It also looked at the advantage of giving anticoagulants and also the role of uh, uh, um, uh, anti-IL-6 drugs when we have the cytokine storm, which again had a lot of controversies. You had paper which showed it was useful. You had paper which showed it was not useful. And meta-analysis subsequently tended to show that there was mortality benefit. Same is the story of remdesivir. Remdesivir is another repurposed drug. But the early data which came out of China and the paper in NEGM did not show it to be useful. And then we had a paper which showed that it did decrease hospitalization by four days and therefore may be of some benefit. But there was really no concrete data. And the WHO trial, which was done multicentric, did not show any mortality benefit. But more recently, papers suggest, the article in NEGM suggests that if, if given early, three days remdesivir, may still have a benefit in terms of decreasing hospitalization and may also decrease mortality. So I think we need more data and that will evolve as a pandemic evolves and as we are able to get more and more data. So this is something that we need to keep in mind. The other important thing that this uh, pandemic has taught us is the importance of everyone collaborating as far as research is concerned. And I think this, when I'm talking of collaboration, I'm not talking about researchers. I'm talking of governments, I'm talking of uh, industry. The classical example is the vaccine trials. Vaccine trials at this speed could not have been possible unless there was collaboration at a level that we have never seen before. Governments put in their own money. The US government invested a lot in uh, uh, vaccine uh, with this uh, whole issue that it will or uh, uh, may not work. There was a lot of uh, uh, encouragement and manufacturing started even before the result of the trials came out. That allowed us to have a vaccine for COVID-19 in less than one year. And there was a lot of participation with the, by individuals from across the uh, globe. India itself was involved in vaccine trials. And I think vaccine has been a game changer for our country because before this, we were the manufacturing hub for vaccine. Now we are the, we are the research base also for vaccine. Biologically, Genovia, Bharat Biotech, we're looking at different types of vaccine platforms, an mRNA vaccine, which can be kept at two to eight degrees centigrade. 
uh, viral protein based vaccine uh, which are going to come out in our country a nasal vaccine and we obviously have the inactivated whole viral vaccine so i think this is something that has really been uh, a game changer but what are the lessons that I, we as a country should really follow and I, i'd like to conclude with just mentioning that the one issue is that we are not good at having a large database if you look at what has happened in the UK, they have been able to have a good health data record and are able to therefore link that with their genomic sequence. They're able to link that with uh, other things like hospitalization and be able to provide good data analysis. India has a whole gold mine of data, but it's never been consolidated into one. The number of patients that we deal with, the number of uh, database that we could have. And I think if we look at the future, we need to invest in developing a good database, which is open source, which others can look at, uh, analyze the data and be able to come out with the relevant uh, information that is required for policymakers and for the research questions that need to be answered. So I think we need to really change the ecosystem. Second is investment in research. I think we need to invest more in research as a country. We've not done enough. There is no growth or path for researchers in our country. People who do research and want to become pure clinical researchers they have no career growth in them. And therefore, they, this leads to a lot of either frustration or moving on to the West where you could still get a good research job. So we need to develop a better research environment. And I think that is something that we need to do. We also need to remember one final thing. The data that we see from the West may not be applicable to our country. We have to do our own research. What happens to COVID infection in people who are malnourished? We talk of obesity as a risk factor. What about malnutrition? What about post-TB infection? There is data emerging that if you have had tuberculosis infection, you could have more severe COVID. What is the interaction between COVID and TB? These are questions that only we can answer and this will not be answered by the Western world. Recurrent childhood infection, does that lead to more chances of uh, severe COVID? Uh, I think these are research questions that we should as a team get together work out on a strategy and answer that. And finally, when we look at recommendation in our countries, it should be driven by science and not by uh, other activities. A large number of drugs get used in our country. It could be drugs like 2DG or others, which actually don't uh, meet up to the scientific rigor that they should have before they get approved. So I think that is another important area that we need to work on. So this is a broad overview that I've tried to give in, the, in 15, 20 minutes of what the importance of research and the challenges of research during the COVID era. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your excellent, brief, but very specific presentation. You have, you have taken us to the impact of COVID on research and other uh, subjects and also a volume of research which must have been good in many places but was not that good, in fact, of course, questionable quality. And you have also started as to for the benefit uh, and specific research questions so this is a lesson which you have learned from your presentation sir and uh, thank you sir again for your kind and you. excellent presentation so i think uh, we uh, uh, i think we don't have any sir so it's over <clears throat> so, uh, thank you, Dr. Guleria, sir, for enlightening us to your lecture in spite of your overburdened busy schedule. As you lead India's response effort to combating COVID 19 pandemic. And honestly speaking, sir, as you are giving an overview of research in COVID era, I would like to state that in our clinic, Bellevue Clinic, Kolkata, we are conducting research already in this domain. Uh, in future, we may need, we may communicate to you also. And with these few words, we are concluding the session. And any, any questions from the participants, uh, they are requested to send to the chat box. And at the end of the program, the, all the questions will be answered. Now we are moving to our next session. Next session is conducting clinical trials. Our chairperson is Dr. K. Mujumdar. We all know that the 
clinical trials and research studies performed in people to evaluate a medical, surgical, or behavioral in intervention. Any clinical trial must undergo scientific, ethical, and regulatory reviews by appropriate mechanisms before they can be approved. Especially for a new drug, these trials are conducted in phase-wise manner to determine if the drug can be approved for use. Our next speaker is Dr. Doipan Chakraborty. He'll be discussing about the different aspects of conducting a clinical trial. The chairperson of this session is Dr. Dr. Kunal Kanti Mujumdar. And presently, he's a professor, Department of Community Medicine, KPC Medical College and Hospital, Kolkata, for nine years. He, he was the ex consultant, UNICEF, Kolkata, arsenic specialist, WHO, member, Fluoride Task Force, Government of West Bengal, associated and joint editor, Indian Journal of Public Health. He acted as investigator and co investigator of more than 20 research projects supported by ICMR, UNICEF. Neri, Iker, Fate, and the Sassy Waters India, Queen's University, Belfast, UK University of California, Berkeley, USA, and, and DNG MRF Kolkata. So he has got a lot of <coughs> experience in, in research areas. Over to Dr. Unal Kanti Mojumdar, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kole and the organizers for arranging such a, uh, organizing such a excellent and very uh, important uh, webinar on research methodology. So as time is short and we, to, and, uh, we are now going to discuss a very important topic that is, that is clinical trial, that is session on conducting clinical trial, which, is, which has got immense importance during this pandemic area because we have got plenty of trials related to COVID vaccines as well as drugs, as Professor Guleria just has said. And uh, without an introduction, uh, we have one very young, energetic and eminent speaker, Dr. Doipan Sharothi Chakrabutti, who has a vast experience of more than 15 years in managing patients at the critical care unit as a senior registered at the Department of Cardiology and Critical Care Medicine of Bellevue, Clinic Kolkata. So as an academician, he was the, he was the college topper at his MD final exam in the Department of Pharmacology, IPGMR Kolkata, and back several awards in the oral presentation at various state level, as well as in national conferences. In the last few years, he has published more than 50 articles in many peer-reviewed PubMed index national and international journals. Last but not the least, he has nearly five years of experience in working as a faculty member of academic wing of Bellevue Clinic in teaching paramedical staffs and awarded as the most popular teacher of that institution. So uh, welcome Dr. Chakrabutti. And uh, I will request you to start your presentation because we are running late. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Mujumdar for your kind introduction. Uh, good evening, respected dignitaries. Uh, it's my privilege to be here and sharing the st stage with the stalwarts in the medical fraternity of India. Uh, things are really difficult for me to uh, compile all the issues of conducting clinical trial in 15 minutes. And uh, Dr. Kole has given me a tough, tough job as, a, as if that uh, Arjuna has been uh, yeah, asked to perform in front of his Gurudev uh, and I would like to say I'm uh, Professor Ujit Hazda is my mentor, my guide in my post-graduation days uh, with whom I have worked a lot and learned a lot and still days I am learning. So with this uh, introduction, I would uh, go straight away into my presentation. Let me share my screen over there. So is my slides are visible? Yes, yes, it is visible. Thank you. So conducting clinical trial in everyday practice. And this is the picture of my college. Nowadays, I'm serving uh, as a senior residence. My college is Diamond Harbor Government Medical College and Hospital. So today I will discuss the issues of conducting clinical trial in everyday practice under following headlines. 
of there will be an introduction, the historical aspect of clinical trial, phases of clinical trial, steps and methods, some updates on regulatory guidelines, challenges that physicians are facing nowadays in conducting clinical trials, and finally, the take home message. So the, as you know that the World Health Organization defines a clinical trial as any research study that prospectively assigns human participants or groups of humans to one or more health related interventions to evaluate the effects on health outcomes. Now these interventions include but are not restricted to drugs only cells and other biological products, surgical procedures, radiological procedures, devices, behavioral treatments, process of care changes, and preventive care also included in, into this aspect. Now, the US National Health Institute of Health, that means NIH, defines the clinical trial as a research study in which one or more human subjects are prospectively assigned to one or more interventions, which may include placebo or other control to evaluate the effects of those interventions on health related biomedical or behavioral outcomes. Now, what are the aims and objectives of conducting this clinical trial? Mainly discovering and confirming the role of new drugs for the future pharmacotherapy, to evaluate safety and efficacy of experimental drug relative to its adverse drug reactions, to change behavior habits or other lifestyle factors. Licensing process of a new drug is also an important issue related to that and to find ways to more effectively prevent, diagnose or treat the disease. Now, as far the global and Indian scenario is concerned, the global clinical trial market size was estimated at US dollar 44.3 billion in 2020, and it is expected to expand at a compound annual growth rate or CAGR of 5.7% from 2021 to 2028. And if you discuss the Indian scenario that uh, tells us that the Indian clinical trial market size was estimated at US dollar 1.6 billion in 2017, and it is ex anticipated to expand at a CAGR of 8.7% over the forecast period. So you can easily assume what is the prospect, what is the possibility, and what is the huge domain inviting us to be a part of this uh, wonderful professional feast. Now, if we look back into the history of this conducting or the development of the clinical trial, the first documented experiment resembling a clinical trial was conducted by King Nebuchadnezzar. He ordered people to eat only meat and drink only wine, a diet he believed would keep them healthy. He also permitted the dissenters to instead follow a diet of legumes and water, but only for 10 days, after which he would assess their health. When the experiment was ended finally, the bin loving people appeared better nourished than the mandated meat eaters. So the king allowed them to continue their diet. And finally, the first person to conduct a parallel arm medical experiment was a British physician, Dr. James Lind. In the year 1747, all it begins. And Lind discovered that of six therapies, oranges and lemons had the greatest positive effect on sailors' health. And within, in his honor, the International Clinical Trial Day is being um, organized and celebrated on May 20th on every year. Now, if we look back into the timeline of landmark events in clinical trial field, then you can see that the term placebo was co coined year, several years back in the year 1811. Afterwards, in 1863, a US physician, Austin Flint, conducted the first medical experiment comparing a dummy remedy to an active treatment. In 1931, a, a remarkable development was uh, occurred in that particular field when there was a formation of US Food and Drug Administration, that means FDA. And this is a, one of the important international regulatory bodies that look after the clinical trials in the global market. Now in 1944, the first publication of results from a multi-center trial were published. And in 1995, the guidelines for good clinical practice or GCP for trials on pharmaceutical products were published. Finally, at a, at, at a basis of latest development in the clinical trial field in the year 2019, the new drugs and clinical trial rules were published. Now, whenever I have discussed with my fellow colleagues and my uh, practicing physicians, they often ask me, 
what are what are these phases what happens on these phases because they feel there are so many events how to remember at what events at what phases what type of events are occurring because uh, to to uh, answer their queries to clear up their doubts i have put this slide in a uh, nutshell to uh, explain what are the important phases of the clinical trials now before conducting the clinical trials as you all know there are some preclinical trials where this is the first step in development of a new drug using the tissue cultures or animal models and there is also information on mechanisms of action efficacy toxicity pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic information are obtained from these studies now once these data regarding the safety and efficacy of that particular any particular molecules are obtained there is a process called ind application or investigational new drug applications that are made from the you know, part of the sponsor or manufacturer and that are submitted to the regulatory bodies like fda and ema and with this approval once the fda or ema or regulatory body thinks that the further process can be carried forward to the human um, participants then ind becomes approved and with this approval of ind letter the clinical trial starts the first phase of this clinical trial that means phase 1 trial this phase emphasizes the safety and it involves 20 to 80 healthy volunteers information on the drugs most adverse effects that means this is the only phase of the clinical trial where healthy volunteers are being taken as a study participant now in the next phase that means in phase 2 trial the goal of the phase 2 trial is to obtain a preliminary data on whether the drug works in patients or who have a certain disease and it typically involves hundreds of patients roughly about 100 to 300 patient participants are being taken or uh, recruited for this particular phase 2 trial now information on safety as well as do, um, dosing schedule are also being assessed in this particular phase 2 trial in phase 2 trial these phase 2 trials typically involve hundreds or thousands of patients and information more concerned on safety and efficacy are being taken um, care of so in phase 3 trials 300 to 3000 participants are being recruited and safety and efficacy of the uh, particular molecule are being assessed so in these phase 3 trials we include a greater number of participants to have a more elaborated data on the safety and efficacy of this particular trial now there is a one step known as drug new drug application review in this phase three trial if it is successful the sponsor applies for the new drug application or nda which is to, uh, to the regulatory bodies like fda and this process includes a review of the proposed professional labeling and inspection of the manufacturing process if the review is favorable the fda or any other regulatory bodies may approve the drug for marketing and that further the phase 4 trial is being conducted and this phase 4 trial are nothing but it is a post marketing surveillance but where it involves the thousands of participants and can last for many years and information on the medications long term safety effectiveness and any other benefits are being assessed in this particular trial now in many literature my fellow physicians practicing physicians uh, many uh, young uh, research scientists have found the terms 2a 2b 3a 3b i have uh, several questions i have received several doubts from many conferences and many panel discussions what is this 2a what is this 2b what is this 3a and what is this 3b so let's clear this a b concept now as you know that phase 2 is another another in another way is subdivided into another uh, phases like one is phase 2a trials and in phase 2b trials what happens in phase 2 trials 2a trials these phase 2 try 2a trials actually a proof of concept studies and phase 2b trials is a dose response studies now in phase 2a trials what happens what are whatever the data available from the healthy individuals the safety and efficacy they are being further assessed on individual of uh, disease uh, population and this is a early phase 2 study and in this study maximum tolerated dose of the investigational drug or mtd are being applied to see the efficacy of this particular drug on the particular study population and in phase 2b trials some dosing studies are mentioned other than the maximum tolerated dose or mtd so in a nutshell phase 2a 
mainly deals how much drug should be given and phase 2b deals how well the drug responds to the different doses apart from this there is a phase 3a and phase 3b trials to phases like phase 3 in phase 3a trials it is carried out on a large number of people or a special population sometimes regulatory it is a regulatory requirement for the new drug applications and it generates data on safety and efficacy phase 3b it it, it is a extended trial of 3a after applying for the approval but before launch and it also known as label expansion to show that drug works for additional type of patients or diseases beyond the original use for which the drug was approved for marketing these may supplement or complete the earlier trials or may be directed to the phase 4 now you can think or you can um, uh, or you can assess that all the phases are complete now i have come to know all i, I have learned or i have get an idea about the all phases of the clinical trial is that so is anything left is anything more to discuss yes respected gentlemen one few things left to discuss and among them one is phase 0 study this is nothing but a micro dosing study what happens in this study there is a administration of single subtherapeutic doses doses among the small number of healthy subjects roughly about 10 to 15 and there is a limited dosing duration of less than 7 days with no therapeutic or diagnostic intent it provides agents pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetic property and is assessed in go versus non go decision making the process of drug there are also advantage that it has a less chances of adverse effects it is a short duration study less number of volunteers are required reduce cost of development reduce drug development times and it is also limited by the facts like study is mainly based on the pharmacokinetic parameters not the efficacy and safety based agents having different kinetic characteristics between micro dose and full dose are not evaluated by phase 0 trials of this is of limited use for agents having non linear pharmacokinetic parameters the laboratory parameters are very limited and expensive and researchers have to depend on the bioavailability and bioequivalence labs now finally there is another phase that is called as phase 5 study which is used to signify the integration of a new clinical treatment into a widespread public health population and it is a survey without the administration of the drugs and it mainly focus to determine whether or not to the therapeutic effect is realized in day to day clinical practice to seek additional marketing claims for new formulation new indication and new combination so this is a one type of translational research now if we jot down all the things all the process in a single slide that means from lab to the market it takes several years as you can see from the slide in the preclinical um, phases usually the, on an average 3 to 5 years are taken for the conducting the preclinical phases in phase 1 phase 2 and phase 2 b in phase 2 b on an average in on age, every phase 1 to 2 years are taken for development of the drug and it is carried forward in the phase 3 where 2 to 4 years are usually taken and there is a process of submission of the Uh, data regarding the efficacy and safety among the healthy as well as uh, disease population to get the nda approval or new drug application approval and finally for the approval it takes one years where the for further processing of the post marketing surveillance or that pms pms are being conducted now what are the in, important methods and steps to conduct a clinical trial now this will be discussed under the following Um, uh, questions because these questions have been asked in several um, seminars seminars uh, several discussions because the, these type of queries are usually roaming around inside the mind of new clinical research in individuals and scientists also so first question who conducts the clinical trial every clinical study is led by a principal investigator who is often a medical doctor the clinical studies also have a research team that may include doctors nurses social workers and other healthcare professionals how the fund is arranged clinical studies can be sponsored or funded by pharmaceutical companies academical medical centers voluntary groups and other organization in addition to federal agencies such as national institute of health the us department of defense and the us department of veteran affairs also in our country i uh, bodies like icmr have a huge role in financing many clinical trials doctors other healthcare providers and other individuals can also sponsor clinical research where are the clinical trials conducted clinical studies can take place in many locations including hospitals universities 
doctors offices and community clinics the location depends on who is conducting the study how long do the clinical trial last the length of a clinical study varies depending on what is being studied and participants are told how long the study will last before they enroll who can participate in a clinical study clinical studies have standards outlining who can participate these standards are called eligibility criteria and are listed in the protocol some research studies seek participants who have the illness or conditions that will be studied other studies are looking for healthy participants and some studies are limited to a predetermined group of people who are asked by researchers to enroll now if you can jot down all the process or sum up all the events in a single picture things like things become like these things so the first process to identify the disease to identify the validate pharmaceutical target to identify the lead molecules and afterwards to optimize these lead medical molecules to taken forward those, those molecules for the preclinical trials and in the clinical trials there is a protocol to be submitted for the approval as well as the sele selection of the investigator and once the approval process is over and approval is um, getting down from the uh, institutional eth ethics committee mm -hmm. or institutional review board then patient recruitment and participation in the clinical trial are coming started then uh, with the data available from the patients data the, those data are entered and reviewed in the software for the final analysis which is called as statistical analysis finally these are presented and published in peer reviewed international and national journals and data are filed and registrations are obtained for further publications so the study design of, um, if you uh, if i if i put it in a flow chart uh, regarding the clinical trial study design the study design in the, first of all starts with a study design study documentation that means protocol the development case report form or crf um, uh, pr um, production patient information sheet uh, making the patient information sheet after a while there is a investigator or site selection ethics committee or submission review approval letter obtaining from the ethics committee commencement of investigators meeting site initiation monitoring of the clinical trial patient enrollment data management statistical review and final report another important term in this clinical trial is and um, in uh, stakeholders in the clinical trials who are they what are their role this is very important aspect we need to know because there are several issues that there are confusions uh, are being roaming about in both the clinical research individuals and scientists who what is this term stakeholders means for and who who are those stakeholders stakeholders and are in an individual or group who is responsible for and for or affected by health and healthcare related decisions that can be informed by the research evidence so who are the stakeholders study sponsors investigators and site personnel monitors in the institutional review board or institutional ethics committee study subjects and the regulators now what are the role and what are the importance of these sponsors in clinical trial sponsors are also have uh, activities to uh, monitor investigate the investigator to uh, monitor over the protocol development and trial design monitoring the audit safety reporting and many a times it has been seen that sponsor outsource part or all out of the responsibilities to the cro or clinical or contract research organization now sponsor can choose the investigator investigator who conducts the clinical trial and the sponsor also monitors the clinical trial and there is a agreement form between the sponsor with the cro's investigator as well as the independent ethics committee or iec now clin uh, clinical trial investigator are also is also an important part of this stakeholder part they have, they have or the particular individual has a multi directional activity they are engaged into the subject or study participant recruitment maintaining the record providing the reports from conduct um, um, trial as per the gcp guidelines uh, recruitment of the qualified staff, staff investigational product maintenance they are proper um, uh, pro procedural maintenance medical care of the uh, study participants and with the regular communication to the institutional review board or institutional ethics committee clinical trial monitor is another part or another important stakeholder roles that is the main or principal communication link between the sponsor and the investigator 
there is a selection and qualification of the monitors and then it is appointed by the sponsor scientific and clinical knowledge to the monitor to monitor the trial are being conducted what is the purpose the purpose is to the secure the compliance and extent of nature of monitoring is determined by the sponsor on site monitoring there are procedures monitoring responsibilities and monitoring report that are usually being conducted by the clinical trial monitor now above all another important criteria to uh, conduct a clinical trial and be very cr crucial role played by the institutional ethics committee what are their roles to safeguard the rights safety and well being of all subjects to obtain documents as per icsa gcp and as per schedule y to review the clinical trial within the reasonable time to continue the review of each ongoing trial at least once in a year and to review proposed research at convenience meetings there is also why they are um, conducting or performing all these activities because there is a risk to subject risk to subjects which has to be minimized risk to subject reasonable with respect to the anticipated benefits subject selection equitable icf to be taken from each subjects or subjects lar adequate provision for monitoring the data to ensure safety no. of subjects adequate provision to protect privacy of subjects and maintain confidentiality data study subjects have also some role in form of providing the icf the signing the icf because these have very much ethical value in conducting the clinical trial now finally the drug regulatory authority india which has an immense role in conducting the clinical trial all over the country and central drug standard control organization or cdc okay, okay, okay. because our time is limited sir, yes, sir, yes, my, yes. my slides i have come, come to an almost an end okay, okay thank, you, thank you thank yeah. you national regulatory body for indian pharmaceutical and medical devices has uh, within the cdco there is a dcgi or drug regulator control general of india which regulates the pharmaceutical and medical devices under gamut of ministry of health and family welfare now updates on regulatory guidelines few notes i have the co-authored on one publication uh, in a pubmed index journal where new drugs and clinical trial rules 2019 what academicians need to know has been published and the main objectives of the new rules are prom promotion of research and development in india faster accessibility to new drugs pred predictability and transparency in approval process improvement data credibility and accuracy the challenges we are facing or the um, scientists are facing are poor study design ineffective site selection poor recruitment involvement of professional patients patients burden or safety poor trial execution and regulatory barriers and approval delays how to overcome the challenges determination of appropriate sample size reducing likelihood of the inconsistencies in protocol appropriate statistical analysis establishment of appropriate endpoints improved use of funds ensuring appropriate eligibility criteria minimize out of pocket expenses of study participants minimize travel and wait times of study participants minimize possibility of contraindicated medicines or procedures factor analysis to improve trade offs based on budget and other constraints increase likelihood of the filling respected and facilitating the local locating eligible patients so finally the take home message clinical trial prospectively assigns human participants or group of human to one or more health related interventions to evaluate the effect on health outcomes it is conducted to generate data for discovering or verifying the clinical claims or pharmacological and adverse effects with an aim to determine the safety and efficacy of drugs in question clinical trial has traversed a long and fascinating journey since its evolu evolution from the Bib uh, by biblical times clinical trials are required to follow the same ethical and legal guidelines as standard medical practice to protect the safety of participants the final outcome of clinical trial is improved clinical medicine after preclinical development investigational new drug passes through clinical phase 1 to phase 4 um, phase uh, trials these phases are provide in detail explanation of pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic profile side effects which may be harmful or beneficial adverse effects and post marketing surveillance clinical trials offer hope for many people and opportunity to help researchers find better treatments for others in the future finally while the need for a growth in global clinical trials continues and many unmet medical needs remain these challenges provide opportunities opportunities to implement operational innovation that can bring medicines that is scientific and clinical innovation to patients who need them more efficiently and efficiently to conclude finally one line a journey of a thousand miles begin with a single step so i thank you all for your patience listening stay have safe stay healthy thank you for your patient listening once again thank you thank you dr chakraborty for your <clears throat> elaborate discussion on uh, clinical trials which are used mainly to test the efficacy as well as safety and dose response as the time is short 
I I will uh, I will again thank the speaker as well as organizer, and I will request them to to start the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Uh, thanks, Dr. Dushpan and Dr. Kunal Mujumdar for this excellent session. Our last session is data management by Dr. Ribu Basu. And I would request Dr. Mujumdar uh, to chair the session, please. Dr. Ribu Basu, uh, he will speak on data management. Uh, we all know that the research in clinical practice includes collection and management of uh, collected data, which will help in further analysis. Efficient data management is essential for meaningful analysis and arriving at results based on the data. Data management includes defining variables, creating study database and data dictionary, entering data and correcting errors, followed by creation of data sheet for analysis and finally backup and, and achieving the data set. This is an essential tool for research and be discussed by our next speaker, Dr. Ibu Vashu. Dr. Ibu Vashu, please. And I would request Dr. Uh, Mujumdar, to start the session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kule. Uh, now we end this session. This is the important session of data management, data analysis. And we also have a energetic young uh, faculty in the Department of Community Medicine to discuss about this issue. We had initially we had enough introduction of this eminent speaker. So straight away, because of this uh, time constraint, I will uh, uh, request the speaker to start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kunal Mujumdar, or rather Kunalda, because you have been always a big brother to me. Thank you for the kind Thank introduction. You. Okay, so it's very cold here, and I shall not make uh, you wait any longer. So today we shall be discussing about data management, and after all these sessions, uh, one after another, one after another, uh, maybe data management uh, in the last part doesn't fit to the planning, but let us discuss about the data management part to some extent. So uh, this slide basically forms the basis of data management. So what is that? Uh, suppose you went to the shop, you bought some uh, chicken, you bought some onions, you bought some ginger, you bought some garlic, some spices, and then you started eating them up. What is happening? You are eating raw chicken with raw onions, raw spices, you won't be able to eat that at primarily. And uh, that doesn't uh, make sense. So what do you have to do? You have to cook them. You have to cut the chicken, wash that. You have to cut the onions and all those things, put some oil and cook them. And after cooking, you have to put them into some very beautiful bowls. And when that food is presented to you, the value addition of the data has been done. Did I mention the term data? So where does the data come exactly? The raw ingredients which you have been buying from the market is your data. So data parser doesn't make any sense. They are just a group of numbers. Mathematicians fantasize over matrices, rows, columns, etc. But to us, data doesn't mean a sense. So what do we have to do? We have to cut the data. We have to remove the rotten parts. We have to process the data and we form something known as information. So from the data, when you are aware, you are making some tables, charts, bar diagrams, those are information you are getting. But even this information, it can make the food palatable, but we very frank, uh, you need to value add more to this. How can you do that? You have to put the data into some beautiful bowls. Why? Because you need to act on the data. That is why you are doing the work in the first place. What's a research without it being implemented? So when you get a call from an IAS officer, they will give you just five minutes to pitch. And if you do not pitch well, it doesn't make any sense. So you have to make the data into information and you do not have to show them rows and rows of tables like we do in our scientific study. Just give them one or two crisp points and that is known as intelligence. 
So you have to develop an intelligence from the information. The next part comes a decision. So that person as a policymaker will make some decision and then will be converting this entire thing into a beautiful culinary experience for you to eat. So that is what we are going to do with data. And uh, let us have some demonstration, small demonstration that will make you awake in this very cold winter or is it very cold in Bakura? I do not know. I was freezing actually anyways. So you see, we had done a study with age, height, smoking sitters, lung capacities, etc. gender. This thing per se is nothing. They are just a bunch of cells in a particular Excel sheet, a spaces that doesn't mean anything. What will you get from this? Nothing. Okay. So let's start cooking this data. Let us try to find out how many persons are male or female. So firstly, we do some thing known as data cleaning. If you do not clean the data, something may happen. What? We had a, done a study previously in which we found that the uh, proportion of hemoglobin in a particular popul uh, population was extremely high. And when we started looking into the data, we found that in several of the cells, the data entry operator has written the hemoglobin as 131, 142, instead of 13.1, 14.2. So that is why the entire average was go going up. So we missed the data cleaning part and that's why that happened. So data cleaning is an import, extremely important part. Talking about data or entry operators, we have got some very good uh, softwares now like AP data. And we often do double checking for errors in the data entry process. Anyways, let us come to this data. And uh, if you can see that this data has been coded as one zero for males and females, can you see that? Why? Why did we do one zero? Because this coding is very important. In the initial stage of analysis, this will be not be a problem. But when you go into some advanced stages like regression, this coding will be very important. So the advanced regression models are built on this codes of one zero. So computer will know them as one zero, but you will know them as males and females. So we have coded this data like this. Now let us come to the forms of data. If you go to the variable view, you will see that height is scale. There is a continuous variable, smoking, gender are nominal variables. Okay, categorical variables. So whenever you are entering the data, your planning starts right from the protocol development part. You will plan the questionnaire like this. The responses will be coming like that so that you can put the data into the uh, questionnaire like that. And then you can enter the data properly. Otherwise you will all get mixed up. We often get data sets where symptoms of a patient uh, hematomesis, melina, comma, 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 and Excel cannot read that. Excel cannot read the commas. So we are in a fix. So you have to be very intelligent in developing your Excel sheet. Your data dictionary should be very well. What is the data dictionary? This part, this male is one, female is zero. This data dictionary has to be made very carefully because whenever you go into the advanced parts of the analysis, if you do not have the dictionary in your hand, you will tend to get loose, lost and all your work will be uh, lost within a few seconds. So you need to maintain a very good data dictionary. You need to plan your data tools. You need to plan your data collection procedures. You need to plan your Excel sheets. You need to plan your dummy tables. What are dummy tables? The tables without any data in them, without any information in them. So good proposal should con contain all of these facets. So this is the data and let us see what we can do with the data. So let us see uh, how many of them are smokers. Fine. I will ask my software. Give me the number of smokers. I will ask them. Okay. And bingo. 10.6% are smokers. 89.4% are non-smokers. So we get that. So from the data, the raw food, we have got some information. That is a table. This kind of table you will find in your thesis, you will find in your articles, etc. But still, this doesn't give us any insight into what is happening. So let's do something else. 
let's try to get something else out of the data and let us try to do a bivariate analysis. Obviously, these things are very intricate and I am in no position to go into the details of this because of time constraints, but just play with this. Another table. So what does the table tell you? Less than five years, no smokers. That was evident, right? You don't smoke below the age of five years. Five to 10 years, no smokers. That's good. 10 to 15 years, people have started smoking. Fine. 15 to 20 years, definitely percentage of smokers at the highest. So now from that particular data row of figures, you get some intelligence that, okay, with increase of age, smoking is going, is increasing. And if we had more data, we could have had some more intelligence. So now you pitch to your IAS officer that this is what is happening, sir. So we need to stop smoke the schools. We need to uh, shift the cigarette shops away from the schools, make awareness campus in the schools so that they do not smoke. And you can make all these kind of recommendations to the policymakers. So that's how from a bunch of numbers, you are actually coming to policy. So this is what is happening in your data management steps, defining the variables, creating the study database and data dictionary, entering the data and correcting errors, creating data set for analysis. And obviously the last part I forgot to mention, you have to save your data set. The good journals will always ask for your data set and you have to save it for a large, long time for ethical and legal reasons. So I'm not going into much of uh, other discussions. Thank you to Elview, uh, Dr. Kole, Dr. Orijit Day for inviting me to this talk. And uh, again, I'm thanking uh, Dr. Kunal Mojumdar for the kind introduction. I am ending my session here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Review, for uh, serving us a very well-cooked and presentable food in a palatable way. So this is a difficult uh, session. And you have explained in a very lucid way, a, a difficult term, definitely data collection, compilation, analysis and interpretation is a very important part of your research. Without that, the research is always incomplete. So again, because of time concept, I again thank to the speaker as well as the moderator, Dr. Kole, for giving us the opportunity to be present in a very valuable as well as important a webinar on research and research methodology and it's important. Thank you. So uh, thanks Dr. Rivu and Dr. Mojumdar uh, for this session. And now we are coming to a concluding session. So uh, I'm really grateful to all the speakers and most important, all the participants. So we have, in fact, we have organized this program um, say within within four to five days, but uh, we were thinking that we should organize. But I am just astonished to found that this program, the number of registration was almost thousand. It was nine eighty one, and even at this time, there are three forty nine participants who are who are listening to us. So uh, so it's a it's a it's a wonderful. Uh, a wonderful program, obviously, and at the same time, uh, we feel the interest of all the participants uh, who were at the at the time of 10 p.m. They are still waiting for this this program, and we have got very few questions. Very few questions we have. First question is uh, the first question is from. Dr. Shottonarayan Puri, Pani Gai. He is saying that in our country, we have plenty of original patient data, mostly maintained manually. We need a dedicated team and systematic record keeping. So is it now high time to include clinical research in curriculum of MBBS? We have here Dr. Hajra. He is presently the Dean of IPGMR. Uh, I, I would request him to say something regarding this question. Dr. Hajira, please. 
Yes, am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so I thank the participant for asking this question. Uh, this is a philosophical question, but nevertheless, it's a very important one. Uh, MBBS doctors, our basic goal is to prepare the Indian medical graduates. Having said that, this is also the stage if we introduce them to research projects and research methodology, it will go a long way in uh, building impetus, building Wonderful. capacity, building in research and encourage young physicians who can engage in meaningful clinical research side by side with their clinical career. Unfortunately, if you look at the MBBS curriculum and the time span it is, the thing that bothers us who are on the side of medical education constantly is that there is too much. It is simply speaking too much. So the volume of information in all subjects is increasing by leaps and bounds. And in some subjects like biochemistry, pharmacology and on, it's simply an information explosion. So while it is good that there's a research methodology component would be there, uh, we can't insist on having too much of that. But if you look at the new curriculum, which NMC is proposed and is implementing with the 2019 uh, admission batch, there is a chance for doing electives. There is a chance for doing electives, one month of which can be spent in a formal research project. So uh, this thing has already started in the BBS curriculum. Can I add a little bit to supplement, yes, uh, Professor yes. Hazra? Actually, I'm involved with undergraduate teaching for many years. But uh, I think uh, in community medicine subject, the students are exposed to some extent because they need to perform a short research project and uh, on true, various topics. True. And this research project is being analyzed and they submit the research project to the department and that is, and they face also in high OC examination during final MBBS part one. So some amount of input is there, there is some scope because as our Professor Hazra has already said, there is plenty of subjects, plenty of, so their time is very limited, but still there are some scopes like uh, they, are, they are participating in various projects, research projects, short projects, as well as ICMR is also uh, encouraging some short student research project and one or two students of third or fourth semester, they are already doing some research work under uh, my, myself. So there are scopes, so, but we need to encourage them because they're already overburdened, as we have already said. So we need to encourage them, uh, the need for the valuable research so that they get interest and uh, perform such thing. Thank you. Yes, and the, the elective which NMC is proposing comes uh, after third prof part one. That means after the community medicine <sighs> projects, other departments can also offer them projects which exactly. interested students can take up. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our, our ne next question is from Shuktothita Ghosh, Kolkata. She is asking, how is plagiarism detected and prevented? Dr. Subrojiti, will you answer? Yes, I can try to answer that. So thank you for that question. I think it's a very important question if we want to publish something which is original. Plagiarism should always be avoided while, uh, should be avoided when you're writing the article. So I think you must give due referencing to when you kind of take in total the um, information from a particular article. So that is the most important part of preventing the plagiarism, that you must give appropriate referencing and citation. That is extremely important. There are certain softwares which are available now and which are completely free. You can access those free plagiarism software and the cutoffs is usually 5% of your text should not, more than 5% of your text should not match in these softwares. To name some of these softwares, I would say that Turnitin is one of them. You can look at PlatScan and these are usually for institutional access. Some of them are free, but then if you are in a medical college hospital or you are within a hospital which is involved in clinical trials or research, you can get access to these software. And finally, I would say that if you are able to always give the proper citation at the end and also, you know, kind of check before it goes to good journals because the journals also run their plagiarism check, it becomes very embarrassing if the 
uh, the journal comes back to you saying that your plagiarism check has evolved uh, or has given a result of more than 10% or 15% because that is troublesome. It, it creates a very sorry figure for yourself. So I would say that uh, start it as you write the paper. Start preventing it. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, another question from Dr. Ruposri Krishna. She is from Mysore. Scope for questionary based research on COVID related issues in COVID times. So, any of the panelists who are here can, can, can give the answer. Can you repeat the question, sir? Scope for. Go for questionary based research on COVID related issues in COVID times. So uh, we have uh, mentioned, you know, I was, I will refer to the discussion with Professor Guleria mentioned that yes, in COVID times, we have seen a lot of explosion of research and questionary based research has been one of the qualitative method in which the, uh, the responses could be obtained that can be done, but please ensure that the Questionnaire is validated. That is extremely important. A pre-validated questionnaire should be used if it's been used for the first time to run a pilot validation test. Uh, route it through the ethics committee because it's extremely important that ethics approval for that questionnaire is available. And then again, as Dr. Basu was mentioning about data management, the questionnaire should, if you're using an electronic questionnaire, for these COVID-19 patients, it should be secured. The access should be secured and proper analysis should be performed. So that those are my thoughts. So thank you very much. So also, oh, Dr. Dr. Ruposri, definitely we can we can do this type of study and if we can organize in a proper way. And, and uh, another question from Balaji Jacharya, can you use statistical analysis in qualitative research? Dr. Dibu, can you answer? Can you use statistical analysis in qualitative research? Uh, thank you for raising this question, Dr. Balaji. Actually, uh, qualitative research and quantitative research difference is out of the purview of this priming workshop. But uh, you have to be very philosophical when we are approaching this qualitative and quantitative research because in one research you are doing an inductive that. reasoning in one research we are doing a deductive reasoning so you do not need statistical techniques whenever you are doing a qualitative research because in qualitative research which is on based on the phenomenological uh, philosophy uh, the narratives are more important than the numbers mm -hmm. okay so uh, you can take home uh, the take home message for now, maybe this only that you really do not need numbers in qualitative research. But obviously, there are many deviations and many ways of doing research, mixed methods, and all those things. We can have some different day to discuss on this. Thank you. So, so thank you very much, all the panelists and also the listeners who are still listening to this program. So, uh, in conclusion, I, I would I would firstly like to thank all the speakers and chairpersons for such a mind enriching extensive session. I would sincerely like to thank all the participants and really we are astonished to find out the, uh, the number of participants. Now it was mentioned that the total number of registration was 1157. And, and at this moment, almost 300 participants are still there. I would sincerely like to thank all the participants, the listeners, without whose support, this session would not have been possible. Finally, I would like to thank Finally, I would like to thank our technical team, uh, Mrs. Ms. Sonal Shah. Just a minute. Mr. Sunal Shah, Mr. Jeet Sharma, Mr. Sachin Mukherjee, Mr. Bharat Rajani from Kadila. In fact, they are working for last five days constantly. 
and at the same time they are communicating with our speakers also and last but not the least i would like to thank mr amit jain from kadila without whose constant support this program was not possible and i am thanking to team bellevue clinic and team advanced care advanced health care foundation particularly i should mention the name of dr orijit dev and dr devdatta haldar and as neil armstrong said research is creating new knowledge we hope that we are able to ignite the spark among all fellow colleagues to start and continue research in clinical practice so thank you very much we are we are concluding the session today thank you all good night